Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Committee of the Whole meeting of Tuesday, February 9th. Uh, these are just committee recommendations that will be made to our regular council meeting on February 23rd. According to the lockdown procedures, it's just myself and the clerk in council chambers and our two deputy clerks are up in the balcony taking the minutes and looking after YouTube accordingly spaced apart and all of council is tuned in virtually so we will uh, we will proceed on that notice so we'll call the meeting to order I'll ask uh, for a motion please for an adoption of the agenda please moved by Councillor Yo, seconded by Councillor Elmsley everyone in favor of that motion that motion is passed thank you is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest on anything on today's agenda from council? Seeing none, we'll move on to item four, deputations. We have one deputation today uh, regarding a water bill for 181 Kent Street in Lindsay. Uh, Mr. Neil Arbor from APG Kent Street Properties Corp. Uh, Mr. Arbor, if you're on the line, can you, there you are. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, we can hear you okay. So uh, just a friendly reminder, you have five minutes. So uh, go ahead, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Neil Arbor, the treasurer representing APG Kent Street Properties Corp. I would like to thank the members of the Committee of the Whole for this opportunity to speak before you on this very important issue. The issue being the water account levied against our former property which was never paid by our tenant, Mr. McDonald of the Grand on August 30th. Mr. McDonald was in arrears on his first bill of $4,132.68 for January 1 to March 31st, due April 30th, 20. This bill was not paid and therefore per your bylaw, 2018-039, section 23, subsection 2306, L and M, repeatedly recited to us uh, states where an, an amount remains owing on a tenant's account after the application of the deposit and the final invoice remains unpaid for a period exceeding 30 days, the property owner will be advised of the balance owing and request for payment will be made. It further states if the balance on the tenant's account remains outstanding for over 60 days, the amount will be transferred to the property taxes for the property where the water and or wastewater services were provided and collected in the same manner as taxes. Neither of these two actions were taken until six plus months after this initial billing was issued and therefore allowed the delinquency to continue until the tenant left on August 30th. We were notified of this default by a letter received at our offices on November 12th, 2020, postmarked November 5th and dated November 3rd, 2020. As we were not aware of the original delinquency, the tenant was permitted to run up additional arrears of $6,942.75. In essence, as landlords, we, have, we had no notification of any default from the city as per the city's own bylaws, and so had no opportunity to collect the initial arrears due in April or to prevent any additional arrears. We only found out about the outstanding balance 43 days after the sale of the, of the building was completed. For the above reasons, we cannot accept the costs for any arrears and feel that we are fully entitled to reimbursement for the full amount of $11,075.43, which was paid by us in protest until this matter could be heard before you. We thank you for taking time to hear this deputation. Thanks, Mr. Arbor. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll get a motion to receive and refer to staff uh, for a report back at the March 23rd council meeting and we'll get some background information and then we can, uh, we'll see if there's any questions. So uh, Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, you'll move that, seconded by Councillor Seymour Fagan. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Arbor on the deputation? Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, go ahead. Uh, thanks for your deputation, uh, Neil, today. I, I, probably most of the questions will be answered uh, when the report comes back, but I guess there was no uh, way of your uh, lawyers being able to track this before uh, before the final closing. Apparently, it, apparently not, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, they they it's not a, a regular column that they would do to track that um, from the lawyers' society. Either side was not not uh, aware of it. 
so they didn't they didn't track it. Thank you. Uh, I'll uh, we'll wait till the report comes back, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Arbor regarding the deputation? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor of the motion? That motion is passed. Uh, thanks, Neil, for sharing your concerns with us. We'll get a mark. We'll get a report back for the March 23rd council meeting, and then council will uh, figure out where we go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Okay, we'll move into item 5.1, which is uh, correspondence, creation of a jump-in form for citizen discussion of services. Uh, correspondence, can I get a motion to receive, please? Moved by Councillor Dunn, seconded by Councillor Ashmore. Any comments on the receive? Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to thank Mr. Webb for sending that. Um, I just had a motion a motion to receive here, but I had a follow-up motion as well, if I could, please. Okay, let me do the motion to receive, and then I'll come to you for a follow-up, sir. Um, any questions on the receive? I'll call the question then. All in favor of receiving the correspondence? That motion is passed. Thank you. Councillor Ashmore, follow-up motion. Thank you. Um, I just had a um, follow-up motion here, and I sent a copy to the clerk um, beforehand. So what my follow-up motion was the following, if I could read it out, please. Request staff to report back at the March Committee of the Whole on the creation of a jump-in public service discussion forum. That includes the features included in Mr. Webb's letter to Committee of the Whole. The report back should include citizen feedback on the advisability slash usefulness of the forum. I sent a copy of that to the clerk and clerk can circulate that for your records if you like. Okay, so that's the motion. Does any uh, can I does anybody want to second that motion? Councillor Seymour Fagan, do you want to speak to it? Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. No, I'm fine, thanks. I just uh, we'll get the report back in March, so if I could just have that sent forward, that'd be great. Councillor Seymour Fagan, do you want to speak to it? Um, I, I just think it'd be good to hear what staff have to say about this. Um, yeah, that's it. Just give us a chance to find out. Any other questions or comments? I'm going to speak against the motion. Um, uh, Councillor Ashmore, not, I don't think it's, not that I don't think it's a good idea. I just, I think we're going around in circles here. I think we've asked staff to bring back a report on customer service in March. I think we should get that report and then we can we can decide where we want to go as a council from there. I think we've already had that discussion. I know uh, Councillor Vale uh, was looking for some information as well, agreed to wait for that report to come back. And I think we're just, we're, we're asking staff to run in a bunch of different directions and we should just uh, wait for that report in March and then go from there. But that's, uh, that's just my thoughts on it. So uh, do you want to sum up Councillor Ashmore or are you good with, with the motion as it stands? Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll just say that this is something that's going to be a bit of more bait for somebody to enter the jump in forum. I just think that we need more, we need more attendance on that forum, more participation, more public participation. And by doing this, uh, I think this would encourage more people to participate in this jump in forum, which is our main right now. That's the only way people can communicate. They can contribute to issues is, is going to jump in. And I think this is an important part of it, but, um, uh, uh, I, I hope you support me on this motion. It's just uh, just to be forwarded to staff for the March report. I think uh, um, CAO is working on that report. He's going to be the author of the report. If I could just get clarification. CAO is bringing back a report, uh, bringing back yeah. a report in March on the customer service as he was directed. Pardon me, I missed that, Mr. Mayor. The CAO is bringing back a report in March as per the direction uh, of council. Okay. Okay, thank you. Everybody's clear on the motion. I'm gonna call the question. All in favor? One, two, three, four, all opposed. Anyone opposed? I'm opposed, motion fails. So just a motion to receive and we'll see that report when it comes back uh, from the CEO in March. Uh, thank you. Uh, item 6.1, we're gonna move right into presentations. Uh, I will, we have a, a quite a few presentations here today. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, again that let's just hear the whole presentation, save your questions till the end, 
and then we'll, uh, we'll hopefully get through them in a, in a timely manner, but lots to get through. So we'll start with 6.1, which is a pandemic response and city services update. Uh, Ron Taylor, the CAO, is going to walk us through that PowerPoint. So uh, go ahead, sir. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and through you to council. Um, it's been a couple of months since uh, our last sort of broad-based update uh, over the holiday season and certainly leading into it. Things didn't change too much, but I know you're all fully aware that things did change and shift uh, over the month of January in particular. Uh, and there was a number of announcements uh, from the province uh, yesterday uh, that are guiding uh, some reopenings uh, coming up into the future. So wanted to just touch base with you. Uh, the mayor asked me just to walk through some of the service implications and so Happy to do that uh, today. So next slide, please. Uh, starting with, sorry, I'll just pause. Uh, we can just go to the next, perfect, thank you. Uh, so as uh, normal updates outline sort of the progression of the pandemic, there was a provincial and local state of emergency declared last March. Uh, both of those states of emergency ended in July of 2020. Uh, there was a recent second declaration of a state of emergency provincially on January 12th, and that state of emergency terminates today. Uh, there's many orders uh, that are under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. They remain in effect until at least February 23rd. Those are the ones that have been rolling predominantly over a monthly basis uh, as part of, the, of that legislation and outside of uh, the uh, emergency declarations. You are aware that the province-wide shutdown order uh, was effective on December 26th, uh, and that shutdown order remains in effect uh, in Kawartha Lakes uh, up until February 16th. Uh, the province also issued a stay-at-home order that was effective January 13th, and that stay-at-home order remains in effect in Kawartha Lakes uh, similarly to next week, February 16th. Uh, the province, you'll recall, prior to the shutdown, established a framework uh, for reopenings uh, in the province, and they have very recently updated that framework slightly. So there are some revisions to uh, various uh, categories, uh, but for the most part, it remains the same. And as communities go back to a regional reopening uh, process, us starting next week, we would defer back and be guided by that uh, provincial framework. And you're probably all aware that schools within our health unit district uh, did open for in-class instruction effective January 25th. And by the end of this week, uh, all remaining health units uh, were on sort of a stage or staggered approach uh, in-class instruction will be available in all health units across the province by the end of this week. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, effective February 16th, so next Tuesday, uh, we will default back to the provincial framework as revised, uh, and it will guide our local service decisions. Uh, it will also guide all of local services and business uh, and economy reopenings. Um, based on our current public health indicators and thresholds, so where we're at locally in the HKPR district health unit, as of today, we would be trending within the orange restrict category. So I've shown on this slide the five sort of stages of the framework. Um, obviously, this would be subject to change if local conditions change over the next week and leading up to next Tuesday. And it could see us uh, either continuing or defaulting to the orange stage or on either side, depending on uh, data, it could shift us back to the yellow protect zone or converse, <coughs> excuse me, conversely to the red control stage. Uh, some of the updates that I'm going to provide for you today are based on the uh, orange restrict assumption that we will be in next week. Uh, next slide, please. So we're expecting uh, later this week to get uh, confirmation 
through the province and the local health unit on where we will be exactly within the framework uh, and prior to Tuesday. So some of the things uh, as part of our ongoing response, our EOC, uh, Emergency Operations Centre remains active. Uh, that is obviously a, a, a forum for all of our local partners, uh, frontline uh, emergency services, hospital, to continue to share information and react and respond uh, to the various orders and local conditions. Uh, the HKPR District Health Unit um, has dramatically increased their public facing uh, information and communications. Um, and that's in all venues and uh, that certainly has been uh, well received and I think uh, quite positive in terms of informing on a week to week basis, uh, local decision making. Uh, some specific services, uh, particular to Kawartha Lake, so our Provincial Offences Office facilitated resumption of audio and video court appearances. That was directed provincially uh, to resume February 2nd. Uh, curbside library service remained open. Public access to Lindsay and Fenland Falls branches were suspended. These stats that I'm providing on this slide are really our response in the month of January and prior to the very recent announcements about where we're heading in terms of openings. Uh, council, board, committee and advisory committee meetings continued and were ongoing. They were solely done uh, electronically. We are looking based on if we trend to that orange uh, as a category in the framework that we would be able to resume uh, member attendance in person uh, to various board, council uh, and committee meetings. So as I understand, we would be targeting if nothing changes, uh, beginning with our special council budget meeting uh, next week to be able to have in-person attendance by members if they, if they wish. Uh, all municipal buildings remain closed to the public, including administration, service centers, arenas, community centers, pools, and fitness facilities, obviously in response to um, the stay at home orders and the shutdown that uh, remains in place. Some of our essential functions and services uh, did continue and have continued, uh, obviously with restrictions, depending on the nature of the service. So landfill sites did continue. Uh, our transit services remain operational and accessible to the public but again, with uh, certain restrictions. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in response to those provincial orders and directives that came uh, right around Christmas time, uh, some services were suspended or significantly altered uh, for the first part of 2021, certainly all of January predominantly. Uh, it did result in some additional temporary layoffs where services were formally suspended. Uh, some staff redeployments did continue and we're still continuing even prior to that direction. And I know you appreciate that uh, technology based access to services, communications, administrative functionality sort of remained. So we were really limited to uh, electronic uh, communications and interactions uh, throughout the services. So most of our over 200 programs and services across all city departments do continue to remain operational even in that shutdown, uh, but obviously with certain restrictions. Uh, we, did, we do have a number, we continue to have external and internal uh, pandemic response teams. So there was two uh, task forces that council struck prior to the holidays with an economic and community focus. And both of those remain very active um, and implementing a number of the recommendations uh, from the, those community groups uh, and council members on the task forces. Internally, we still have an active uh, team looking at business continuity entirely throughout the city. Uh, we have a pandemic response team that continues to look at our staffing uh, and our actual service delivery through that health and safety uh, lens. And it continues to be very responsive uh, and active. We continue to follow the provincial screening and guidelines and requirements as an employer. And uh, we continue to be in the same uh, general 
condition that we were prior to the holidays. So we are seeing some staff screened and offline to get testing uh, or monitoring symptoms. Uh, but for the most part, um, that's been declining and we're starting to see uh, back to full uh, staffing levels where it makes sense. Uh, next slide, please. So some considerations. So now that we're heading into uh, the potentially the orange category beginning February 16th, there are a number of business units, program and service areas that we need to have a look at uh, and how we would be reopening those. Uh, so I'll start with arena ice use. So that is permissible under the conditions we're anticipating to reopen on Tuesday, February 16th. Current ice rentals and contracts will be honored. Some minor hockey groups, minor groups with a current contract may be requesting additional time. Uh, those would continue to be considered in those facilities that remain open. No new rentals or contracts though uh, will be issued for the remainder of the ice season. So we wanna respect the uh, rentals that we already had in place or traditionally have in place with local groups. Uh, masks are mandatory in all areas of these facilities, except for the on ice activity. And there would continue to be a zero tolerance uh, for violating any of the COVID-19 protocols uh, that would be applicable or in place. So we've continued to work with uh, organizations to enforce that and make sure that there's an accountability with respect to meeting uh, all of the ordered uh, requirements. Uh, so ice use, just a couple of other items related to uh, arena use. Uh, so all participants uh, are limited to our health unit uh, residents as part of those bookings. Uh, this protocol is exempt for minor sports organizations uh, that belong to the PSO, which allows uh, out of our zone members uh, to uh, participate. On ice participation is limited to no greater than 25. That's assuming the orange category. Uh, there are no spectators that are permitted. The only exception would be for one parent or guardian to assist children under 10 years of age. Uh, any changes or extensions to the stay at home order or shutdowns or changes from orange um, to a more restrictive category could uh, force uh, some additional closings uh, for the remainder of the season. We're working towards uh, the ice times to the end of March 31st. So as you can appreciate, if there's any further delays beyond February 16th, we really think it would be in the best interest of the city to start closing uh, some of those uh, arenas. Uh, next slide, please. So other facilities, so our pools uh, reopen Monday, February 22nd. This is based on health unit approval and staffing availability. So as you can appreciate, although some of these items can um, open earlier, there is typically some implementation that's required in advance. Pools, for example, would require uh, a health unit inspection prior to formal opening uh, as an example. So that's why we're targeting February 22nd to be able to uh, properly resource these items and get the requisite sort of preparations uh, in place. For pool use, uh, limited access to pool areas will be based on capacity restrictions in that space. Uh, aquatic lessons are canceled. The spring session, uh, which follows in April, will be offered uh, if we are still trending sort of in a positive direction. Public swim programming will be offered. Pre-registration remains required uh, for those events. Uh, masks are mandatory in all areas of pool facilities, except for the in-water activity itself. And no new rentals or contracts will be issued for the remainder of this winter season, so up to the end of March. Our fitness centers and facilities, uh, we're targeting reopening those as well on Monday, February 22nd, again, based on resources, uh, limited access to weight rooms, cardio and group fitness areas uh, are permissible based on capacity restrictions in those spaces. Pre-registration remains required and masks are mandatory in all non-exercise spaces. Uh, next slide, please. Our community halls, 
so they are permitted to reopen on Tuesday, February 16th as well. All current hall rentals or contracts at that time will be honored. Uh, new hall contracts will only be issued uh, to, to conventional sort of contracts uh, and local residents and groups. Um, I apologize, I, I noted there's a limit of 10 people permitted for indoor activities. And as we've been pouring over the, the various regulations, I understand that hall spaces are subject to uh, occupancy limitations, but for indoor activities where it's, uh, where it's distancing can be done, uh, the limit of 50 is actually permitted for uh, indoor events. Masks are mandatory in all of our halls and facilities. Uh, and we do have, as you know, uh, community halls, many of them, uh, the smaller ones managed by volunteer management committees. Uh, so again, those halls would continue to be uh, reopened, uh, but it will be based on those uh, committees uh, readiness and resources to be able to do so. And as you can appreciate, the occupancy levels would be dramatically reduced because of the size of those particular spaces. Service centers, we are targeting to reopen next week on Tuesday uh, with restrictions. That would be three, uh, Lindsay, Kobokok, and Omimi. For libraries, uh, limited in-person services would resume on Tuesday, February 16th at the Lindsay, Fenland, and Omimi branches, and all others would continue to operate for pickup service uh, at curbside. Next slide, please. Uh, so while we focus on public safety and minimizing service disruptions, we still continue to review how our services are delivered. Uh, and you will recall that uh, there was a request from council to report back at the end of Q2 uh, to report on our pandemic experience. What were some of the service changes uh, and how what would be some that could permanently uh, deliver service uh, over time. So we will bring that information forward to you next quarter. Uh, we did target and accomplish the 2020 year end break even budget. Uh, through cost containment and service changes that was directed by council to target. We continue to focus in the immediate term though on response and sort of readying uh, and responding particularly to next week's uh, shifts in service, uh, but delivering or launching various recovery efforts uh, at the same time. Uh, there's been several economic development programs and supports that were launched uh, later last year and ongoing. Uh, the Digital Main Street program and Shop Kawartha Lakes campaigns, for example, have been very successful and well received uh, by local small business. Uh, next slide, please. Now I'll just conclude, Mr. Mayor, that uh, again, while we are uh, ultra focused on um, our response, we want to make sure that concurrently we're continuing to ready and looking to recovery and also looking to reset our services. Uh, the city has shifted funding and invested significantly, uh, predominantly over 2020 and some decisions going into 2021 for various economic and community recovery efforts and uh, certainly commend all of council for uh, those decisions uh, where over $23 million has been invested or shifted into uh, community and economic recovery efforts. Uh, and so that, uh, with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll conclude. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, I'll just, uh, what I'll do is I'll ask for a motion to receive, and then we'll see if there's any questions. Councillor Yo, moved by Councillor Yo, second by Councillor Richardson. Any questions for the CAO on that presentation? Councillor Yo, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, not so much a question as just a, uh, thank you to staff and uh, yourself and the CAO and the rest of council. I think uh, we've been doing a, a, a good job uh, in the past and going forward following a good plan. So just uh, kudos to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Any other questions for the CAO? Count, uh, Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you to Ron or maybe uh, Director Shanks. Uh, they're talking about the ice uh, rentals are going to be open uh, as of the 16th uh, 
according to the rules and until March 31st. Is there any uh, expectation or opportunity to extend it past March 31st, uh, uh, maybe say to April or something, if uh, there was uh, if there was a willingness for people to rent, or did most of the rental just commit to uh, March 31st? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'll just start very generally to sort of say that our winter sort of season uh, is predominantly or traditionally to March 31st. Uh, there certainly is uh, ongoing ice that's offered and available uh, through uh, Lindsay at least uh, for spring uh, ice services, uh, but I will turn it over to the experts uh, and the director maybe for some detailed question with respect to uh, utilization. To, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor. And uh, thank you, Mr. CAO. Just to further on that, yeah, so the current ice season does end on March 31st. So right now there is, uh, or roundabout there, there is no uh, current contracts for past that. So there's been uh, no requests past that. We have currently, we've just recently put out uh, the spring summer uh, ice request allocations. And so they are due in now and staff will be reviewing them so that we can uh, set up an ice schedule. Uh, if everything permits us uh, to move forward with that based on the current color codes and where things are at. Uh, and that would be similar to uh, past years where we would be providing ice in the Lindsay facility. Uh, and we would anticipate that uh, that will hopefully be able to provide enough ice uh, for all the users across the city. Uh, the other aspect to it is that uh, the majority of the staff and all of the staff, in fact, at the non Lindsay Recreation Complex facilities in the April timeframe are being transitioned to servicing our outdoor uh, recreational areas and parks uh, as they do both. So it would become a staffing issue uh, to try to keep some additional arenas uh, open across the city uh, in April and past that date. But we are hopeful and assuming uh, that the Lindsay Ice Services will allow us to meet any demand that is out there uh, for the spring season. Maybe I can get you to stick around, Director Shanks. I think I've got a few questions for you as well. So just as a follow-up to that, if I can, in maybe in the, in the other direction, I've, I've heard a few minor hockey associations have pulled the plug on their season with the shutdown and everything. And is there still justification for reopening the seven ice surfaces as opposed to pulling one or two or three of those ice surfaces out early because we don't have the use we had pre-shutdown or are you seeing a, a justifiable amount of continued contracts to keep those seven ice surfaces going till the end of March? To you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the answer to that is a little bit twofold. Uh, so there is no, with the ice that's still remaining in the seven ice pads that were opened up originally uh, because we chose to keep them in, there is no uh, negative costs associated with keeping them open for February the 16th. So what we plan to do is having all of the existing contracts honor them and for the first week uh, sort of gauging what the use is of each of those facilities and if there is a requirement or if uh, it makes sense to condense our ice surfaces down and relocate some of the existing users into other facilities so that some facilities would close then we would do that but we're going to use the first week uh, to gauge that and go from there. Uh, part of the, so you're correct, Lindsay Minor Hockey is one association uh, that has uh, canceled the, the remainder of their season. Uh, there are a few other groups, however, saying uh, that they might look at some additional hours. Uh, so it might balance itself out and go back to the same levels as it was uh, pre shutdown. Uh, the other component to it that we are taking into consideration and wanna see how next week works is even if we could shift all into, let's say five arenas or five ice pads and close two, how much congestion or increased uh, attendance at those facilities is that gonna cause? And for a matter of six weeks, does it make sense from a health and safety perspective to keep our users a little bit more spread out uh, so that there's uh, less uh, congregation and potentially then helping or assisting with limiting any impacts uh, that might take place due to the pandemic. 
Sounds like you have it under control. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Ashmore, you had a question, and then Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, just a question to the CAO. I wanted to thank him for the update. The question is, will there, will there be a media release sent out today or tomorrow to the public? Because there just still seems to be some confusion as to what's open, what's not open, what color scheme we're in. Um, there still seems to be a lot of confusion and uh, um, who can open up and who can't. If you could sort of elaborate on that and whether we can release that information. Clarity by tomorrow. Thanks. Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I know that everybody is pouring over all of the recent regs that were just released yesterday. My, uh, our, we are targeting towards the end of this week to put out a definitive directive with respect to communications. And that's really the main reason being is uh, we certainly don't want uh, to mislead the community in terms of the framework. And so we are following up with or through the health unit to determine sort of where those metrics are trending. My big concern would be we put out definitive information uh, to the community and then we shift from orange, let's say, to red and it becomes more restrictive. And there are also then certain uh, industries that get affected, for example. But I would strongly recommend that uh, individuals can go on to the uh, provincial website. Uh, they did release yesterday the uh, revised framework. I think it's an excellent sort of document to walk through at least where you would be trending, what are the changes in those respective categories. Uh, but again, I, I really think until we get precise information, we're probably looking at a couple of days uh, to really launch the communications on it. But we certainly would do that as a normal course of things anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Richardson. Thank you, and I also want to echo um, Councillor Yo's sentiments. I think it's, everybody's done a tremendous job. I'm just looking for a bit of clarification on the outside user groups renting our arenas if they're not in the same health unit but are already have prior rental agreements with us. Are we changing that so they aren't coming in or they still are allowed to come in? I'm just looking for clarification. Sure, I'll go. Doctor, go ahead. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, so basically any existing contracts uh, that were in place prior to the shutdown, we will honour. Uh, we are not, as uh, the CAO's presentation suggested, we are not taking additional uh, contracts. Uh, we are not renting out any further ice to any groups uh, outside of the Quartha the Lakes. Uh, and all users, uh, that at our facilities, with the exception of some minor sports organizations, where again, the CAO has indicated that uh, the provincial sport organizations allow for some minor hockey groups to draw some of their members from outside of our health unit region. Uh, all users of our facilities uh, need to be uh, members of our public health unit, for lack of a better term. And we are monitoring that, and we will be uh, requesting uh, specific attendance notifications by all groups so they can identify the exact people that will be going into the arena uh, and that they are a member of their association uh, and if there are concerns addressed uh, then we will deal with it with the rental group uh, and if they have members from outside of the health unit uh, then we would be following up and the zero tolerance would take into into play so those are the same rules that were put in place when we first started renting prior to uh, so again, if they've got an existing contract, we would honor it. Uh, we're not looking at extending any more. Uh, but if they were, if there was some people sort of sneaking in uh, and using uh, one met one person on their ice group going on to use it, and there are complaints, we will be enforcing the zero tolerance protocol. Thank you for clearing that up. Thank you. I have a couple of quick questions, Craig, if you don't mind. Um, on the Forbert pool, when you say pools, you're targeting. February 22nd, I know it's been newly renovated. Are we targeting it for 22nd, just, just for interest sake? Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, yes, we are. Thank you, and, and on- Pending those, pe sorry, pending those two items that the 
the CAO mentioned. So again, the similar to the Lindsay Recreation Complex, before we open a public pool, the health unit has to go in and do the inspection. Those inspections are scheduled for next week. So we're hoping they come back okay and we're good to go. And uh, the, I know that the uh, slide presentation showed some uh, temporary layoffs that took place. Uh, I think you're all aware that many of those were uh, in the aquatics area. Uh, so just ensuring that we can have those staff back and provide them some training that's required as well. So we anticipate the answer to that being yes, and that's what we're gearing towards. When you are able to firm that up, uh, I think for all of council, can you just send us all a quick note and just confirm some of those dates so that the uh, local councillors can let the residents know as well? That'd be great. Thank you. Um, on the community hall use, uh, where it says new hall contracts will only be issued to Halliburton, Kawartha, Pine Ridge District Health Unit residents, I'm going to assume that that includes our seasonal residents who own property up here. I know there are cottages, cottages are a big part of our hall usage in the spring and summer, so can you clarify that? Or I don't know if they're considered part of our health unit district, but they are property owners, so. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe that as a property owner, uh, that they are would be considered a member of our regional health unit, and therefore uh, they would be uh, able to rent some of our facilities. We will need to confirm that as well. It's a good question, uh, but I believe that uh, your understanding would be correct. Part of what we're doing there, again, is to try to manage uh, the standpoint of other areas that might be in uh, stricter zones than us. And for reasons of higher levels of, uh, of COVID uh, taking place, and we want to limit that impact on our region by them coming and renting our facilities. So that's the rationale behind it, but I believe your understanding would be correct and we would confirm that. Thank you, appreciate that. Councillor Almsley, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I think your question is a good one from the point of view that if someone comes into our health unit whose primary residence is not in our health unit and they were to be tested positive, that test case would go back to wherever their primary residence was and would not be considered as a case in our health unit. So I think perhaps we need clarification on that um, from, uh, from the health unit. I think Director Shank has confirmed he's going to get clarification, but that's how he understands it would work. So uh, I know if he has any questions, he can contact the chair of the health unit. Do you know who that is, Councillor Elmsley? I believe you do. Thank you. Uh, don't answer that. Uh, any further questions for either the director or the CAO on the presentation? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. Uh, all in favor? That motion has passed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Taylor, for the update. Appreciate it. We'll move down to item 6.2, which is the GIS Mapping Public Viewer. Uh, James Ald, uh, Manager of Mapping and GIS, is going to give us uh, uh, a bit of an overview on an exciting uh, application. If you're there, James, can you hear me? Sorry, the host just had to unmute me. That's okay, we can hear you, go ahead. Uh, I'd just like to say good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council, and uh, thank you for uh, the time today to introduce you to some new mapping applications uh, that we will be that are being rolled out to the public. Um, so we just wanted to bring that to uh, Council's attention at this point. Um, again, uh, this is the current status and road ahead, and uh, we can move to the next slide. So a very brief history of uh, GIS with the uh, Kawartha Lakes. Uh, an assessment done in 2014 indicated that we were approximately 10 years behind uh, similar municipalities in Southern Ontario. Um, as a result of this assessment, the GIS division committed to building the infrastructure necessary to support public services. Uh, and in 2019, uh, live testing of the services began with selected users. Um, several mapping services have been soft launched in early 2020, a soft launch just being uh, a release of an application without formal announcement or support, sort of just to test the waters. Next, please. 
So the current status, uh, in May 2020, we released our GeoHub front page for the city. Uh, GeoHub page is uh, basically a website or front page for searching uh, the city's GS data maps, applications, and our repository for data. Um, secondly, we released our open data initiative. Um, the intent of an open data initiative is to move away from um, silo data internally. Um, a great example of what we're doing here right now is working with Public Works and they're reviewing and cleaning over two dozen of their data sets, uh, water, sewer, storm infrastructure, signs, utility poles, etc. And when done, when cleaned, these data sets will be posted on open data for anyone to view, download, and use. Um, it's usually uh, businesses, um, uh, telecom, things like that, that would like this data. So now they can just go and pick it up instead of having to go through public works. Um, the other big step we're doing uh, right now is embedding maps in the city's uh, web services. If I could just have Kathy click on this um, slide. And here you'll see an example of that, where we have the beaches and boat launches uh, coming up on the city's website. This is the main website page, and inside of it, we've put the map, um, and the user can go in and search for boat launches or beaches, click on them, and get the information they want um, right inside of the actual uh, city's web page. So um, these are some of the initiatives we're uh, undertaking right now. My next slide. And this is the big one we're working on to analytics. And this looks a little busy right now, but don't worry about it. It's really about getting to know our clients publicly. And this is an audience overview page from Google Analytics, which we run uh, all our information through. And um, there's a couple of interesting takeaways from this. We don't have to get into it all. But um, Kathy, can I just have you click on that uh, image, that picture? Uh, say no, sorry, uh, click off the picture just over to the, uh, by the text, yeah, there we go. First one is the number of users. So we have 1,098 uh, public uh, users accessed the site in the last month. Um, this is fairly significant. In September, we had less than 100 uh, users accessing the site. So it's, it's increasing quite quickly as the public uh, comes looking for more information. The second takeaway um, from this, uh, the more surprising one, and again, Kathy, if I could just have you click on the left side anywhere, is this right here. This is our uh, location of our users. So the biggest proportion of users visiting our, our site um, are from Toronto, 234, uh, whereas, and it's actually 380 users for the entire GTA. and. 132 from the Corth Lakes. And we were surprised by this because we expected um, users in the Corth Lakes to be at the top. Um, we're still looking at exactly why this is. We've got a couple of ideas. Uh, there'll certainly be more to come on this, but this was a really interesting takeaway that uh, we're getting a lot of people looking at the property and planning within the city from uh, areas such as Toronto. And next, please. So the takeaways that we have from the public applications to date um, are interesting and, and certainly uh, require more research. But 22% of our uh, users right now are coming from the GTA, 12% from Kawartha Lakes, and 65% from elsewhere. And the categories of interest we're finding that they're looking at are uh, number one, real estate, so living, investing, buying. Um, number two, uh, telecom and related businesses. Uh, three, planning related, so that's uh, property owners within the Corth Lakes uh, looking at building permits, lots, etc. Fourth is uh, tourism and recreation, and fifth is just the kind of curious people that like to look at a satellite image of their own roof, um, something like that. Uh, people like to do that for some reason. Um, and just on the, uh, the first image here is actually um, just uh, a screen picture of an iPhone 8 
uh, using the application. I was going to do a live demonstration, but given the jumping back and forth and certain realities, um, I think it's easier just to provide uh, a couple of pictures of how it works. So this is the initial application on an iPhone 8 that the public would see. You've got uh, bookmarks, measurement tools, drawing tools, um, a search tool for addresses, your layers, things like that that you expect. And if we can get another click on that uh, slide, Kathy. So I went in and I just did a quick search uh, on 180 Kent Street at the top. And it, uh, it brings the map in, shows 180 Kent Street, highlights it, and then it gives some property information. If we click on that button, and Kathy, if I could get you to click uh, slide again, we see the property information come up, and this is what the public will see. So we get the roll number, the PIN number, uh, legal description, um, legacy township, if it's there, the ward, and then we get also the zoning. So we get the zone type, community facility, zone name, community facility, and also the zoning bylaw that they can refer to. So this one is the town of Lindsay. And then we always um, strongly recommend that if uh, a user is seeking further information, um, they contact uh, planning directly and we provide links here for them to do that. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, um, there's one more thing on the FAQs. So um, here we have frequently asked questions, but we also have uh, created a number of tutorials and recorded them on our YouTube channel. So if a user is wanting to learn how to do something or may not be sure about something, they can come in here. There's a whole series of tutorials that they can uh, look at. They're all under two minutes um, and they're not complex. Uh, just to help them out. So uh, this has been a real, a real, uh, a real help to people. Next, please. So uh, one of the questions we get are, are what are the benefits uh, for doing this? And so we, we look at it for, from the public, for the public, um, easy to access, otherwise complex data. Uh, the information is available 24 seven. Uh, it provides input to the city on public needs. So uh, allow, it allows the city to target resources accordingly. For the city, uh, we get cost savings resulting from greater efficiency. Um, things like uh, the, the calls going into planning, the requests from planning for property information that um, take time, that take a lot of effort. Uh, the user can now do that without having to put that onus on the planning department. Uh, until such time as they're ready to contact them about something specific. Um, for the city, it involves better decision making. Um, it also um, improves communication between the city and the public, and it provides a responsive and dynamic uh, service delivery. And just um, to give an example of this, it would be um, I'm just looking for, oh yes. So as, as an example of, of how this may work, this responsive dynamic service delivery, uh, we are working with economic development who has seen this map and uh, they're very interested in uh, a tool that can uh, aggregate searches um, for properties from the public. So they can tell what types of properties are being looked at by users from which locations. For instance, uh, they would like to know how many users from the GTA are looking at residential lots, commercial lots, agricultural, seasonal residences. Uh, is it an urban or a rural search? And then with this information, economic development is hoping to be able to tailor some of their programs and services accordingly. So we gather that information, feed it back, and it's kind of, it comes back, in, comes from the public, and then we adjust it and it goes back to the public. So it works quite well. Um, so it is very beneficial to everyone. And next slide. So next steps, what are we going to do? Um, looking ahead uh, 2021 and beyond, we are looking at uh, perhaps a municipal service portal, uh, which would mean sort of one stop 
uh, one page where we could have all the city services, waste and recycling, um, transportation, public works, everything like that, and uh, the user could go in. We are looking at uh, things like uh, building permits, and there's just a picture here of uh, one from another uh, municipality where they have all their building permits online and users can click and get a little uh, um, information on uh, on what's uh, what's going on there with that build. And uh, finally, um, we're going to be working with uh, IT um, to take the public input from these sites uh, and feed them directly into the city's content and asset management systems. Um, and from there, again, we can start to look at models of service delivery, how they're working, how they're not, what we can change. One of our biggest goals right now as technology gets more complex and things like that, and something we're really striving for this year is kind of removing the GIS from GIS in that we're looking for simple, intuitive uh, searches and interfaces, getting what you need when you need it, easy to use, readily accessible information, and the user should not be expected to learn how to use uh, anything complex. Um, it should just work. And if we click on there, uh, we will see that. Oh, that's been taken out. OK, no worries. Um, yeah, just click again there, Kathy. Um, that's just some analytics. Click once more. So it's nothing there. Okay, yes. That's what we don't want the user to ever see. And we don't even need to bother with that. That's just, that's just our side. So that is a very quick, uh, a very brief overview of what's going on. Um, I would certainly be happy to uh, go into further detail uh, with anyone um, about any of the services, what we can do, um, anything like that. And um, at this point, I would be happy to take any questions. Thanks, James. Good stuff. Appreciate that. I'll get a motion to receive Councillor Richardson and Elmsley. Uh, questions? Councillor Richardson, go ahead, and then Elmsley. Thank you, and through you. Um, thank you for the presentation today. Um, I know I've been using it a lot. It's a fantastic tool for me to help out my residents. Um, I know you mentioned that we have done like a soft launch, and I was wondering, do we have a targeted date for a hard launch on this? At present, uh, no. Uh, I think the goal was to uh, move to through SMT and then to committee the whole, and at this point, uh, hopefully working with uh, communications to look at an official launch um, sometime fairly soon. Well, well done. It's, it's an awesome tool for us to have to uh, communicate from the city to our residents. So thank you for bringing that presentation forward today. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Almsley, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I had a question regarding, uh, do we use Google Maps for uh, this technology or are all of the maps created by ourselves? Um, through the mayor to Councillor Elmsley, uh, we do not use uh, Google Maps ourselves right now. Uh, we use a uh, software platform uh, called Esri ESRI Canada. Um, they are the foremost sort of mapping software uh, around the world, and that's what we use. Now, that can be integrated with Google. Uh, Google can be integrated with uh, our maps, but um, we do most of it uh, in-house uh, with our staff. No, I just noticed that the uh, Google trademark was on a number of the um, uh, of, of the slides you brought up. Uh, so it kind of triggered my question because I know there's a problem over on Balsam Lake uh, with um, visitors who are following Google Maps trying to get to uh, the Balsam Lake uh, campsite, which is the provincial campsite. And if they follow the Google Maps, they end up uh, down a private road 
um, in someone's front yard rather than at the uh, at the uh, park that they're looking for. And I just wondered if there was a tie in there in, in any way, shape or form, so we could kind of fix that. Through the mayor to uh, Councillor Elmsley, um, we have been made aware of this several times and we have uh, looked into it and provided some uh, suggestions as to uh, what's going on, why it's happening and how it can be remedied. Uh, it's, I can certainly uh, follow up with you in more detail about that if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Seymour Fagan, go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, through you, and thank you very much for this, James. This is fantastic. I know that people will be accessing it a lot um, now that we know. So my question is, is it ready to go now? Through the mayor, through uh, Councillor uh, Seymour Fagan. Um, it is ready to go right now. Um, it's been, it's been sort of that soft launch has been moving along. Um, the thousand users in uh, in January that you saw, um, they're just finding it um, with Google searches or moving through the city's pages. Um, so it is ready to go, but again, we haven't done any kind of official launch, a media launch, anything like that. And uh, that will be coming up shortly. Do you know when shortly? Because I know people are looking now and they're looking for this information now. So I'm just wondering when we will be doing that. Thank you. I don't know exactly when I will need to talk to communications. If they go on to the city's website right now and look at the mapping, um, there, there are links there that will take them to these uh, sites uh, right now. Uh, we just haven't released it to the media in any format. Okay, thank you very much. And great job, fantastic. Thank you. Welcome. James, I would just add, if when you do know when it's gonna be launched, uh, by all means with communications, you know, certainly uh, have somebody let council know because we'd be happy to push it out to our residents as well. So uh, uh, I think I echo everybody when I say the sooner the better and uh, great job. Councillor Dunn, you had a question, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, through you to um, uh, Mr. Alt. Um, so there's nothing right now. And, and, and why I'm asking is um, on a task force that I'm chairing right now, uh, some of the uh, civilian members were asking for, for mappings. And we could just point them in that direct, uh, direct so they can see all the maps they need to see. Would that be fair? That would be fair. Thank you. See, sometimes short answers are the best answers. Um, <laughs> any further questions for uh, James before we let him go? We have a motion to receive then. Uh, call the question, all in favor? And that is passed. Thanks, James. Appreciate the update. Please keep us posted. Thank you. Thank Stay you, sir. Safe. Okay, we'll move into item 6.3, which is a Victoria Manor redevelopment and long-term care update. Uh, I think Mr. Ron Taylor and Rod Sutherland uh, are gonna give us uh, a bit of an update on where we stand there. Uh, Rod, are you there, thanks. Ron? Yep. Okay. Sorry, uh, thanks. Go ahead. And, uh, through you, uh, Actually, the director, uh, Rod Sutherland, is going to kick off the presentation, and he was kind enough to uh, let me piggyback on this update to council uh, just because of the timing. Uh, there's been some study and review done in the long-term care sector. Obviously, it's an industry and a service that's top of mind right across the province. And so uh, while it's top of mind sort of in the immediate uh, sort of response, operations, and care, um, in the background, we have been contemplating for quite some time uh, a requirement to redevelop uh, our own Victoria Manor over time. And so we didn't want it to get lost in the information. And so the director is going to provide you with an update first on that overall process. And then uh, if I could, I'll just touch very briefly on some of the directions that we're going in with our uh, colleagues and friends in Eastern Ontario on long-term care advocacy. I'll just turn it over to the director. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, I'll start with um, I think you froze up on us there, Rod. We're not hearing you. Would you, do you want me, Mr. Mayor, to uh, maybe continue with the second half and then when the director comes back online? Uh, yeah, why don't you do that? Save us, uh, save us a bit of time and see if we can get them back. Thanks. Sure. So uh, I'll just ask the clerk if you could uh, move the slide deck forward to slide number five. So as I mentioned, uh, with this uh, service uh, and industry certainly being top of mind, um, it was an identified priority of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, uh, even pre-pandemic. Um, and so when that priority was developed uh, in about January of 2020, uh, the caucus agreed to do a comprehensive study and review uh, to look at our circumstances and really it's sort of a, a standard approach to informing advocacy before simply going in with our hands out, if you will, to upper levels of government. We want to make sure that we're doing our homework and that we're demonstrating sort of best in class, if you will, uh, in terms of how we do our business and then the recommendations. So the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus uh, contracted KPMG uh, in 2020 to complete uh, really a two part study uh, or review, uh, a situational overview, we call it, is really the phase one study. And that's really looking at profiling our own service, how we do service, uh, and all of the stats and data and information uh, right across the Eastern Ontario membership uh, and municipal homes. Uh, and there's 15 of them that were uh, part of the scope of the study. Uh, obviously, Court the Lakes, we had one municipal home as part of that review. Uh, represents about 2,386 uh, licensed beds uh, in the province. And so the study was to review and inform not only what we're doing to sort of share best practices uh, locally and within each of our own homes, uh, but to also inform advocacy uh, to the province. And, and certainly um, in retrospect, it was so timely to be able to launch this study sort of when we did because we were really able to provide some informed uh, submissions right across the board. So at the uh, AMO conference, we introduced the priority shortly thereafter. Uh, we committed to the government that we would do this full review and bring back recommendations to them at the uh, Roma conference, which just passed last month. And we did that. Not only did we present the findings and, and recommendations through to uh, the minister's panel and forum, but we had a separate venue directly with uh, the Minister of Long-Term Care uh, who received our recommendations and study to inform their work that they're doing as well. Uh, there is a Long-Term Care Commission uh, that the province launched. They're also doing an active and concurrent review of long-term care facilities and homes. Uh, and we were able to get a submission in to that commission formally uh, at the end of January. We just made a recent submission to the Ombudsman of Ontario, who is also doing a thorough review of long-term care homes uh, in the province. So we were able to provide that. And we also shared the study findings uh, with AMO, so our provincial advocacy arm and FCM, our federal, uh, to those respective audiences. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a notation. This was our uh, online forum with the Minister of Long-Term Care at Roma. And uh, they were good enough to give us quite a bit of time uh, for us to uh, present our findings uh, to them. Uh, the study is quite large. Uh, it's in two parts. And so I'm just providing the link. If anybody is interested, we certainly have circulated it internally. Uh, we're already using some of the findings and best practices uh, in our own home, 
but really right now, because it has just been finalized, we're more uh, sharing it and distributing it uh, to all of our partners. But you can go to the EOWC website, it's on the screen, uh, if you wanted to view these studies in their entirety. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the key takeaways, and again, I really strongly encourage if there's interest to go to the studies, uh, there are some good summary slides, uh, and I won't do it justice in the quick two to five minutes that we have uh, here today. Uh, but really, when EOWC drilled down uh, and looked at ourselves and then looked at the circumstances, uh, one of the key areas that's emerging is the uh, provincial commitment uh, to achieving a four hour of care model. Uh, and so we want to do some further work with the province on what that looks like, how it's funded, uh, and what are the um, uh, skill sets and positions that would uh, meet that definition. Um, we also are committed, we want to look at recruitment of additional staff. This is a, an issue right across the province in all uh, home styles and formats. Uh, recruitment is a constant uh, challenge uh, and certainly in rural Ontario, I would say it's uh, exponentially uh, a problem. The uh, implementation will ensure that EOWC has a solid workforce and financial stability to achieve those provincial benchmarks. Uh, and certainly we share the province's objective of expanding long term care beds, reducing operational red tape and increasing process efficiencies. And so next slide, please. Uh, this conclusionary summary. Um, sorry, I'll just wait for the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so this really is a, a snapshot uh, summary of the uh, recommendations and advocacy. So increasing funding to achieve that four hour of care model and target. Uh, and you'll see that it lists on the slide some of the elements associated with that particular recommendation. Uh, one of the other recommendations to the province is changing their funding formula. It's extremely complex, doesn't, uh, doesn't recognize sort of um, specific specialized care. It's a CMI model, it's called, and we're really just saying simplify it, fund on a per bed basis, uh, because that's pretty uniform uh, right across the province. Increased provincial capital funding. Uh, whether it's for maintenance, but also for new beds. Uh, the province is committed to uh, targeting the establishment of 30,000 new beds over the next decade. Uh, obviously, that's going to take a monumental effort from all service providers, us included, as municipalities. And uh, we really want to look at the funding model in particular uh, with the province, because as you can appreciate and know, um, we're looking at, uh, on average, new build uh, long-term care facilities ranging from the 50 to $80 million cost. Uh, and to carry those costs uh, as a municipality over a longer term, we could be spending tens of millions of dollars alone simply in financing and carrying costs that we think could be better uh, targeted and channeled into those direct uh, new bed uh, establishments. So that's another issue that we're uh, continuing to advocate advocate for uh, with the province. Certainly we wanna promote support resource sharing between long-term care homes, whether that's formalized shared service, collaboration in certain areas, bulk purchasing, how we do reporting, uh, recruiting of staff across the board. Think that there is some um, efficiencies there that can be gained uh, for the overall industry. And finally, uh, recommended increase efficiencies and effectiveness. So supporting continuous improvement models within the homes, uh, developing provincially led uh, leading practice units in sort of how things are done, especially when we've got uh, a pandemic that we're managing, for example. So specialized services and coordinating those. Uh, so I think again, uh, Mr. Mayor, with that, I'll uh, leave it. Uh, and if uh, the director is back online, if the clerk wouldn't mind starting the uh, presentation from the beginning, then uh, I'll ask uh, Director Sutherland to talk about the redevelopment of Victoria Center. I think Director Sutherland's having some issues with broadband in his whole building, but he's attempting to get come back on by phone. Are you there, Rod?
No, he's not, he's not able to get back on, Ron. Can you walk us through this portion of it? We'll have to go with that. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for that. So, uh, as I mentioned early on, uh, for a couple of years now, we've known that we need to start looking at uh, planning the redevelopment of Victoria Manor. Um, as you may know, uh, it was opened in 1990. It's a 166 bed municipal uh, operated long term care facility. Uh, it's managed or governed under the Long Term Care Homes Act. Um, enhanced Long Term Care Home Renewal Strategy was released in 2015. So starting to look at sort of where the industry is heading and how municipal homes should be uh, not only maintained, but then uh, refreshed and the rebuilds in the future. In July of 2018, the province committed to creating 15,000 new beds. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the director wanted to provide just some uh, further background, larger background. Uh, so when we look at it from, through a, a Lynn uh, lens, it talks about 68 homes being in Central East. That's about 9,700 long stay beds. Uh, there's a number of stats that uh, I won't do justice, so I won't walk through uh, at length. Uh, but certainly they were there to provide you just with a snapshot of the demographics uh, and how we're managing and dealing uh, with our service. Uh, on the right hand side is more gen general community standards. So we, we know that we have an aging population locally and provincially and nationally. And so we really do need to, as part of our redevelopments and those provincial commitments, uh, make sure that we're working towards uh, an expansion of long-term care beds throughout the province. So as you can see, uh, our own demographic, we have over 10,000 residents that exceed 75 years of age uh, in Port the Lakes. Uh, next slide, please. And so as part of the redevelopment, uh, we were targeting, I believe the date, uh, the director could probably give you a better snapshot, but uh, I believe by 2025, we had to have, uh, we had to meet the new requirements uh, of the province and we're targeting the completion of the redevelopment project for the manor. Uh, so that was the date and target five years from now, approximately. Uh, in 2019, we started the preliminary sort of process, if you will, to that. Uh, so we need to look at and assess what we currently have. Uh, the Ministry of Long-Term Care has not identified a future intake for new development or redevelopment. So they tend to do that, whether it's annually, it's probably more over a couple of years uh, cycles where you can, as a municipality, uh, provide an application and an expression of interest to redevelop. And that's what sort of gets you in the queue for the provincial funding. The pandemic impacts on future development or redevelopment standards are still somewhat unknown. We do know for sure that how we design facilities though are gonna be completely different than we were even contemplating or assuming just a year to two years ago. Uh, and the Victoria Manor redevelopment uh, will be reviewed in the context of revised standards and the ministry direction. So we're continuing to work with the ministry, but during the pandemic, uh, a lot of those redevelopment conversations uh, have halted or have been suspended, but we wanted to at least touch base with you and bring this forward, that it is something that is being worked on behind the scenes over the remainder of this year for sure. And I suspect that year end, early next year, we'll be bringing some more uh, direct uh, recommendations and updates to you. I think that's the last slide, Mr. Mayor. So uh, on the redevelopment update, I'll uh, leave it at that, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions I can. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, jumping in there. Um, we'll just get a motion to receive, please. And we've got Director Sutherland back to help with questions. Councillor Dunn and Yo uh, to receive the motion. Any questions uh, for Rod, Count, uh, Director, or Councillor Dunn? Go ahead, and then Yo. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is just a general question to uh, to both uh, Rod and when I first joined council, 
Um, I'm trying to find a nice way to say this, but uh, homes for the aged, because that's what they were originally called, uh, were viewed as being a bit of an albatross around municipal governments now, a direct conflict um, with, uh, with private uh, providers. And from a, from a fiscal point of view, as an opposed to a, um, um, a service point of view, municipalities couldn't compete uh, with, uh, with municipal or with uh, mm -hmm. privately owned uh, firms as far as um, what they could do and how they could do it and still remain fiscally responsible. Now, obviously the, uh, the pandemic has exposed weaknesses um, in the private home owner um, uh, scenario. Um, but then we've had outbreaks at our home too. So are we anticipating going down a different road where as something that we're required to provide by law uh, we're now seeking to provide by choice. Uh, and I'd love to hear some comments on that. If you, and I could start maybe, Mr. Mayor. Um, my apologies first for losing the connection. Our whole building here has lost uh, uh, internet or network connection. So um, I'm on my phone right now. So apologies uh, if the uh, sound or video isn't good quality. Um, just overall, and the CAO can probably speak to it as well, just because uh, there is a direct connection with the EOWC work, um, which I believe he's already covered. Um, uh, but the, yeah, the, the trends and the differences that have been highlighted, um, I think there's been differences between the different sectors highlighted through the pandemic, um, I think will be key to the continuing review. There's the review coming out of the, the commission that was set up last year. Uh, um, uh, of the sector. There's the uh, ombudsman's review that was announced last year. There's continuing uh, assessment and review of the outcomes of the, the uh, um, public inquiry into the uh, safety and security of residents that came about a couple of years ago from the, uh, the case in southwestern Ontario um, of the uh, multiple murders and attempted murders in a home. So all those things together, I think the entire sector is look to be looking at it. Uh, ownership management of homes, um, where that goes exactly, it's hard to say, but the, from the municipal standpoint, uh, there certainly seems to be uh, more of an acceptance from, uh, from my standpoint, from what I've seen through AMO and other groups, uh, EOWC, of the municipal, continuing municipal role with long-term care uh, as, as that direct connection to the community. Uh, but uh, maybe Ron may want to expand on that based on the EOWC discussions. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, I'll just simply add that uh, the direct advocacy from the EOWC isn't for municipalities to get out of the business. We think that I would suggest that there is still um, a need for municipal run homes. We're not advocating at the same time, though, that we replace or uh, look at taking over sort of other parts of the, uh, the industry, whether it's private or not for profit type uh, homes. But I do think uh, what I have seen sort of through the study does confirm that there's a place for municipalities to ensure, and this is sort of a very general statement, but uh, to have local facilities that are uh, in rural areas in particular, so that you can age in community or there's that option or opportunity. Uh, certainly I would suggest that the partners across the board would, would feel that they're running them as fiscally responsible as we can but certainly as we're shifting and moving, um, it, it is going to be more expensive to operate these, uh, these uh, facilities. Uh, so I think it's a needed and necessary municipal service, uh, but at the same time, I think to your point, Councilor, we need to maintain fiscal responsibility as best we can and continue to work with the government to uh, help fund these uh, expansions and, and heightened uh, requirements of these facilities. Yeah, I don't have any issues either way, um, but I'm going back to when I joined council. Um, I always had the, the impression that we were unwilling partners and we were, we were in the business uh, because uh, we were forced to be in the business by government regulation. Um, that was the impression that I gathered when I first joined council. 
and um, uh, I recognize that in underserviced areas, the municipality has to get involved. For me, it's uh, it's more a case of underfunding by the provincial government, mm -hmm. and um, um, obviously we need more regulations. But uh, it was just with the presentation. Um, I didn't know whether or not we were changing our focus and rather than being there as private industry, uh, we're looking at uh, this being being run uh, by governments all over period. And obviously if the government involves in it, we're capable. Um, uh, I, will, uh, I, I will just leave it there and it was a good presentation and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Yo, you had a question, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, in your uh, first part, you did wrong, which was the second part. But the, um, on one of your slides, it, uh, and you kind of didn't mention it, but it said address labor relations. So my question basically is, um, have the unions been part of this uh, ground uh, work you're doing at EOWC with were the unions part of that? Because, because as... Um, Labor relations in the in the long term care is very important because they 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 are the people who are out there doing it. Um, they are they are one of the well one of the if not the biggest uh, cost consideration in the in the industry. And I want to know if they're one they're included because the government I feel has to really lay down the law on the roles and responsibilities of each staff member. And with this four hour um, stuff coming in. There's going to be some new positions. They're going to be um, expanded workforce and stuff. And there has to be defined roles and responsibilities for all of this stuff. So, so how deep did the warden's caucus go? And and will there be a chance to talk about roles and responsibility, or is that just going to be left to the industry? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, in terms of the our study that we completed, there wasn't direct consultation with the unions. Uh, it was really meant to be, let's look at what we're doing uh, in our municipal homes across Eastern Ontario. So that was the lion's share of the data gathering and information. The advocacy piece, uh, again, was more uh, political to try to influence uh, you know, provincial and federal decision making and funding uh, for municipal homes. So uh, Although we didn't directly consult with a number of groups because it was really looking at it through our lens and perspective as a service provider, uh, a lot of the recommendations were to the province to make sure that they consulted with and developed different plans, whether it was uh, recruitment, whether it was they launched a staffing plan, for example, in 2020, in December. Um, and all of that advocacy was basically suggesting exactly what you're saying. Not so much what the target is, but if you want to do it properly, you need to consult with uh, the employees, with the unions uh, right across the board, because uh, you're absolutely right. The biggest issue probably that was identified was staffing needs, four hours of care and how you staff and recruit for that and how you uh, sort of manage those people. If I could just add as well, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, the the independent, the provincial independent commission uh, that is reviewing the sector uh, isn't being inclusive of consultations with unions and as well as various associations to ensure that they're looking at the full spectrum uh, spectrum of, of services from staff through families, residents uh, across the whole the whole spectrum. Thank, thank you, and I, and I appreciate that it's being. It's being taken into consideration because it, it it's a dynamic workforce. It, there's so many different aspects to it, right from resident council right through to to the uh, the nurses and looking after the shift works and stuff like that. So, so I'm glad it's being looked at. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, uh, Councillor Seymour Fagan, and then Councillor Ashmore. Thank you. Through you to the director. I sit on the uh, board of management and this is my second term on this. And I think I just want to clarify or, or just so everybody knows we didn't as a municipality decide just to, um, you know, make or, or build, redevelop Victoria Manor, that the province 
has asked everyone to become, and this is everyone across the board, is that correct? To become, what was it, a B grade home by 2025? Um, correct, the, the, uh, the home is currently a B category um, mm -hmm. with the, the new the standards that came out in 2015. Uh, we're expected that all homes would upgrade or redevelop to a to an A grade home by 2025. And the primary pieces within there, um, there's a number of uh, specific uh, features, safety features primarily that that differentiate between the different levels, uh, including room size. There, the homes go from A, B, C, and D. Uh, D and D and C. I'm not sure if there's many or if any left in the province now. But they included ward type rooms, like four people to a residence to a room. Um, Victoria Manor has uh, uh, just single and double rooms. Um, but the expectation was under the under the strategy is to, for homes to upgrade to level A by 2025. Um, and in discussions with the ministry, based on that they don't have any more current uh, intakes planned or no one at this time, um, partially looking at. The, the, the uh, impacts of COVID are, I would almost guarantee, are going to likely change those standards somewhat um, before future changes are looked at. Uh, but they did confirm for Victoria Manor, we are currently compliant with the legislative uh, fire code uh, requirements, such as being sprinklered and the fire suppression systems that already exist. That's one of the biggest differences um, from level A to B. The other the points that make is the level B are primarily around space issues, uh, room size, uh, door widths and things like that. So there's minimum door width. Uh, I don't have them in front of me. I think it's 46 inches and ours are currently 44 inches, uh, I believe, uh, that, that those types of differences. So as the new, if they're going to be renewing or reviewing those standards in light of COVID and, and expectate, or expe uh, expecting different uh, um, uh, design features in response to a pandemic. Um, I expect uh, they'll they'll redefine everything in that context, um, and then clarify our requirement to to uh, redevelop by that time or by what time we would uh, uh, have to meet the standards. Okay, thank you. And just one more. To, and we applied for the funding, but we weren't chosen. Other homes were, but we weren't yet. So we're just waiting to see and maybe there might be more funding than the 20 million that they were loaning to us um <laughs> so the actual so just clarify after you mr mayor the, we haven't we, we've been working towards the application the, the full application has not been submitted or is not submitted mm -hmm. yet um we've been identifying the, the primary things we've been working towards identifying a site uh site location for a new uh, new home uh potential repurposing of the existing facility or what would what would happen with the existing facility as well as uh, one of the biggest things is the long-term financial plan the impact of, of the redevelopment and the subsidy model we'd be looking at financing uh, the, the municipality financing being responsible for about probably between 15 and 30 million dollars in financing costs over 25 years so there's pretty substantial impacts on there that were still being reviewed in the context of the actual submission of an application. Okay, thank you. And I, you know, I just want to give a shout out to the staff, to yourself and the staff at Victoria Manor because they've been doing an amazing job through this entire pandemic. And you know, it's not the easiest job that they're having to deal with right now. So, so just thank you and, and thank you to all the staff, at Victoria Manor. Okay. And just, um, just as a comment, um, uh, sorry, Councillor uh, uh, Dunn mentioned before about outbreaks. Victoria Manor has not had an, an outbreak due, during COVID. A uh, COVID outbreak. There hasn't been one. Um, and uh, as went out today uh, uh, as a release, I uh, just want to uh, highlight that all residents at the home received their first vaccinations this past Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ashmore, you had a question. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just a question to the director, Director Sutherland. Um, when this, I'm just trying to understand this every time we bring this topic up of um, redevelopment or renovation or replacement of Victoria Manor. This is a, a 30 year old building and we've been told that it's out of date. Now, I'm just trying to draw an analogy here. I'll, I'll, I'll use the Ross Memorial Hospital. It's in three sections. I think that's a good example. Uh, the latest one was built 2003, the next one 1975 and the oldest part of that hospital was built in 1963. That's 50, 58 years ago. And the Ross Memorial Hospital has the highest accreditation of 
it's as high as you can go it's in, in the province. But they're fine. I mean, they don't have to replace that section that was built in 1963 or the one built in 1975. Why, why is it that the long-term care sector is told to replace their facilities when they're only 30 years old? Um, to you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, the um, under the new standards, um, the redevelopment doesn't mandate that there has to be a new facility. Uh, redeveloping the existing facility renovations um, is is a uh, uh, another option, uh, depending on the nature of the changes that would have to be made to meet the new standards. That may or may not be feasible or or cost. Uh, 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 cost effective things such as when I mentioned that the space of a room increasing the square footage per resident room door widths and things like that uh, would be very limited within an existing facility there was options considered originally um, consideration given the, the ability to say add on a third floor or another wing to the building um, again the combination of the costs to uh, do the renovations is sufficient to meet the new standards uh, were estimated at the pro roughly the same or uh, almost the same as what a new building would be. Uh, again, like increasing the actual floor space per room would be very difficult within the existing footprint. So the actual rebuilding of a new facility is not necessarily required, um, but would be part of that analysis. Um, in terms of the age, the the a 30 year old building is, is part, partially so the nature of the timing of the last build, uh, when the previous facility was replaced, um, the province has the ability, they, they legislate and regulate the sector to determine what those standards are. Um, and uh, there, there are newer facilities, I, I would expect, that are uh, not compliant, uh, less than 30 years old, and there are some older ones probably that are compliant. Um, so while the age seems uh, to be certainly an issue, um, it's not the factor from the provincial standpoint of meeting those standards. There is, the ex uh, and I believe in the uh, discussions or the uh, analysis of the Eastern Ontario um, Warden's Caucus study that uh, identifying that 45 years is sort of a generally accepted lifespan for a building for a long-term care home. So it is well below that from, uh, from a, a facility standpoint. So hopefully with, with some of the clarification that may come, or if there is clarification of any changes with the uh, um, as a result of a review by the province with the review of the sector from the pandemic, um, there may be uh, some ability to look at some, maybe some more flexibility around what that development might look, might look like. Thanks for that. Okay, any further questions on the uh, Victoria Manor long-term care? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. I will call the question, all in favor? That has passed, thank you. And thank you, uh, Director and Ron, for, uh, for the update, appreciate it. Let's take a quick five minutes to stretch and we'll come back at quarter to three and continue on.
Okay, we're going to call the meeting back to order. We got to our quorum. Uh, we'll move into item 6.4, which is the community safety and well being plan presentation. Uh, we're going to get a presentation from Brenda Stonehouse. There you are. Welcome, Brenda. Um, I'll turn it over to you. We can hear you, so please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm pleased to be here today to talk to you about the development of our community safety and well being plan. Kathy, do you have my slides? It was up there. Thanks for the presentation, Brenda. <laughs> my best one yet. Wonderful, thank you. Next slide, please. <laughs> Under the Police Services Act, uh, the municipality is required to develop and adopt a community safety and well being plan by July 1st of this year. The process will be guided by a multi sectoral advisory committee. The advisory committee will have representation from a number of different sectors and service providers, including the police, health and mental health, education, community and social services, and children and youth services. The legislation also requires community engagement and consultation throughout the development of the plan. Next slide, please. The development of a community safety and well-being plan is an action item that is included in Council's strategic plan, aligned with an exceptional quality of life. It furthers the goal of building social infrastructure and supports the goal of improving the health and well-being of residents. Next slide, please. There are a number of benefits to having the community safety and well-being plan. Municipalities that have developed a plan have seen better communication and collaboration among sectors and agencies, and have seen stronger families and better opportunities for healthy child development. There's also an increased understanding on the priority risks, which resulted in a focus on vulnerable groups and neighborhoods, as well as changes in service delivery to better respond to those risks. Next slide, please. The province has provided us a planning framework that includes four areas of intervention, social development, prevention, risk intervention, and incident response. And I will give you some more context for each one of these areas. Next slide, please. Social development is about promoting and maintaining community safety and well-being. It's very broad based and long term, and we're looking to improve the social determinants of health to reduce the probability of harm and victimization. We want to ensure that everyone in our community is safe, healthy, and educated, and that they have appropriate housing, employment, and social networks that they can rely on. Community members should not only be aware of the services that are available to them, but should also be able to access them easily. Next slide. The next area of intervention is prevention, which is about proactively reducing identified risks before they result in crime victimization or harm. We will be looking at various sources of data to help identify the major risks and then implement, implement strategies in order to reduce them. We would like to see people feeling safe and less fearful and having more confidence in their own abil abilities to prevent harm. Next slide, please. Risk intervention involves multiple sectors working together to address situations where there is an elevated risk of harm. This is intended to immediate to to be immediate, to prevent an incident from occurring, whether it's a crime, victimization, or harm. The interventions are designed to reduce the need for incident response. Once again, we'll be looking at our local data to inform our strategies in this area. Next slide, please. The final area of intervention is incident response. These are the immediate and reactionary responses by police, fire, paramedics, or other organizations. Many communities invest a significant amount of resources into incident response. 
Although it is necessary and important, it's also very reactive. We will look at ways to better collaborate and share information to ensure the most appropriate service provider is responding. Next slide, please. In the planning cycle, we will identify priorities, determine what outcomes we would like to see, select programs and strategies in support of the priorities, and implement and review the plan. Then we will start again. <laughs> it's a continuous cycle. Next slide, please. In order to develop our community safety and well-being plan, we will obtain multi-sectoral buy-in and a commitment to collaborate. We will engage our community as well as focus groups to collect data and analyze the risks in our community. We're going to assess and leverage our strengths, establish performance measures, and then put our plan into action. Next slide, please. So there is a report on the agenda today to establish the advisory committee and to approve the terms of reference for that committee. The advisory committee will develop and implement the project plan and will bring a draft plan to committee of the whole by June of this year. We will also update council on any changes that will be needed for implementation of the plan going forward. And that's it. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Excellent. Thanks, Brenda. I might ask you to do all the presentations this afternoon if you're, uh, if you're available. I appreciate that. Can I get a motion to receive, please? And we'll see if there's any questions for Brenda. Uh, Councillor Vale and Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, any questions for Brenda regarding the plan or we've got a report so she'll stick around. Councillor Yo, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question through you, Mr. Mayor. I noticed on one of your slides you boiled right down to expelling students from school. Like that's pretty wide encompassing. So what kind of scenario, to put you on the spot, what kind of scenario would we get involved in uh, school expulsions? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we're looking at our entire community safety and well-being. And so education is one of the sectors that will be um, part of the advisory committee. We're looking to identify gaps in our community um, at all of those four risk levels. So yes, on the surface, you think, okay, someone is expelled from school. What does that have to do with anything? But that could be a trigger or a sign um, that there's victimization or harm or a crime. It's our social determinants of health is good education. So we wanna make sure that we're able to flag those potential risks, look at what gaps are there, potentially um, provide some services or referrals for service to someone who might be having difficulty in any situation. So yes, it's extremely broad based um, and we will be looking at really the, the top gaps in service at this point, the low hanging fruit for lack of a better term, but those things that we already know are gaps in service and then through the years we'll be refining it. Does that help? It does and thank you for that. Thank you. Any further questions for Brenda on the presentation? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. I'll call the question all in favor. That's passed, thank you. Uh, well, Brenda's gonna stick around. We have a report 641 in your agenda. Uh, I'll read the motion that report CAO 2021-002 Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan be received. That the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan terms of reference appended as attachment A to report CAO 2021-002 be approved. That Mayor Annie Letham, Councillor Pat Dunn, Director Rod Sutherland, Kawartha Lakes Police Chief Mark Mitchell, and OPP Kawartha Lakes Detachment Commander Tim Tatchell be appointed to the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan Advisory Committee. And that the appointed Advisory Committee members be delegated the authority to appoint the community representatives to the Advisory Committee from the sectors as identified in the terms of reference and that be forwarded to council for a recommendation. Does anybody want to move that report? And then we'll see if there's any questions. Councillor Seymour Fagan, seconded by Councillor Richardson. Any questions on the report while we have Brenda on the line? Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, go ahead. Uh, just, just a brief uh, couple on, uh, uh, I agree with certainly everybody that's on the committee. I just wondered when so broad braced uh, at this point, should we be thinking about people like from the, uh, a member from the mental health organization or from the education system, or you probably have thought about that before you form the committee. To you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, um, we have a requirement to have representation from those sectors. Um, we didn't have 
uh, confirmation of who from those sectors was available to sit on the committee uh, by the time we had to finalize this report, which is why we're asking for the authority to be delegated to the committee members being appointed to appoint those members. But yes, we will have health, mental health, uh, social services, uh, children's services. They're all listed in the report. Every sector will be represented. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you. Count our our Councillor Elmsley, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wondered uh, within the municipality, how broad based would it be? Are, are we going to be taking members um, from outside the Lindsay area? Will it, will it be throughout the whole municipality? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, it is throughout the entire municipality and we will be doing uh, community engagement throughout the municipality as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions on the report? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion. I'll call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Appreciate the update. Okay, we'll move into item 6.5, which is a fleet services review presentation. Uh, I think we've got a consultant on board, but I'll turn it over to Director Robinson, um, Director of Public Works. I think he's going to make the introductions. Are you there, Brian? I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to advise that uh, um, Todd Bryant, uh, Manager of Fleet and Transit, will be uh, providing the introduction. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon through you, Mr. Mayor. I'm pleased to introduce Roger Smith of Richmond Sustainability Initiatives. Richmond Sustainability Initiatives have been involved in consulting projects since 2001. They, their focus is mainly on energy, sustainability, and fleet management analysis. RSI has conducted literally hundreds of these types of reviews since 2001. They have a broad client list uh, from all over North America that includes Ontario Ministry of Energy, Sustainability Development Canada, and Union Gas, just to name a few. Through their E3 Fleet System and Municipal E3 Fleet Review Program, more than 40 Ontario municipalities have been helped to reduce operating costs, improve best management practices, and reduce their carbon footprint. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Roger Smith and his PowerPoint presentation of the entire, uh, of the City of Cortha Lake's entire fleet and transit services review. Uh, thank you, Zod, and uh, uh, thank to, uh, thanks to everyone on today's uh, uh, call to uh, hear our highlights of the uh, Fleet and Transit Services Review that uh, our organization completed for the City of Cork Lakes in, uh, in late uh, uh, 2020. Next slide. Um, so it all began uh, when the city of Cortha Lakes Fleet and Transit Services sought to have an independent third party review of its fleet management operations. Uh, the, uh, the city issued an RFP uh, in March 17th of 2020 and on May 15th, we were engaged to uh, complete the project. Next slide. Um, the scope was to develop recommendations regarding uh, potential savings, efficiencies, service enhancements, staffing levels, maintenance, locations and structures, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Uh, and it was to include the uh, general and emergency service fleet and include the public works uh, uh, sections, the transit, fire, police and paramedics. Next slide, please. Um, the key focal points uh, included life cycle. Uh, it was a very broad reaching initiative, but uh, the key focal points were to include life cycle optimization, uh, service and maintenance best practices, uh, contracted versus internal resources, um, insourcing versus outsourcing, the cost benefit of both options, uh, fuel management, uh, use of vehicles, procurement practices, and uh, as well, alternate fuels. Next slide, please. Um, our approach and methodology, uh, which we've um, defined over many years of, of doing this, this uh, type of work, um, starts with data collection. Um, we, uh, as the old saying goes, uh, you know, you can't manage what you can't measure. So uh, we started with um, collecting uh, data, historical operating data from the city of Corth Lakes fleets, um, including a list of vehicles and equipment, but also makes models and years, uh, the kilometers traveled in a one year review period, 
the fuel used during that period, the maintenance and repair costs during that period, and many additional data points, which were all loaded into our proprietary software, which we call FAR or Fleet Analytics Review. So from the historical data, we then pr produced a baseline. And uh, from that baseline, we uh, sought to identify and, and the, the current day status of the fleet and establish a number of key performance indicators that would help us position uh, CKL's fleet uh, relative to municipal peers. Next slide, please. Um, we started with exception management. Once we had the baseline established, we started with exception management, uh, essentially finding the outliers, finding vehicles within the fleet that uh, exceeded thresholds for performance, uh, whether good or bad. And uh, basically we call that internal benchmarking. Um, we then analyzed each vehicle in the fleet, uh, unit by unit, relative to similar vehicles within the fleet. From there, we moved on to peer fleet comparisons. Um, as Todd mentioned in the introduction, we've been doing this work for a long time now. And we have completed actually almost 200 municipal fleet reviews across Canada and into the United States. So we have a very large database, um, primarily municipalities, um, about 50,000 vehicles that we can make comparisons um, fleet for fleet. So we plotted um, uh, Cortha Lake's key operational statistics alongside the similar data points for comparable municipal fleets to identify any gaps or any substandard performance. And um, the, the goal in doing this was to highlight opportunities for improvement and to underscore any areas for further investigation by our team. Uh, I just wanna point out that it's very difficult and challenging to find um, fleets that are exactly comparable. So um, I, I can discuss that later if someone wants to hear more about that, but we used a uh, normalizing process to, to uh, compare um, fleets that were closely similar in their operating characteristics. Next slide. Um, from there, uh, we know that stakeholder engagement is, is totally important. And um, we, uh, unfortunately due to COVID, normally what we would do is face-to-face uh, -face workshops and uh, meet with the user groups, meet with the actual drivers of the vehicles, meet with the union, um, meet with everybody and get everybody's opinions about what's working well and what could use some improvement. But um, due to COVID, we uh, used a virtual uh, process. Uh, we had a number of virtual meetings with uh, user groups, um, probably eight or 10 meetings in total. And we put together a number of online surveys uh, that went out to a, 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 a cross section of individuals, both from the operational level, right up to management uh, to hear what mattered and what could use improvement and so on. Um, from there, we next moved on to a best management practices review. Uh, we had four best management practices review meetings with each um, fleet management personnel from fleet and transit and paramedics from fire rescue and police uh, to hear and learn quickly about uh, each fleet's operational practices and procedures. Um, we reviewed shop work orders, uh, preventive maintenance worksheets, uh, driver reports, uh, daily vehicle inspection reports, fuel dispensing practices, um, vendor invoices and work orders, transactional data. Um, all of the fleets were very um, cooperative in, in providing us uh, a, a lot of very informative information which our team analyzed. Next slide, please. Um, first, it needs to be said, to put it into context, CKL's fleet is large and diverse. By Canadian standards, it's a large fleet. There's no escaping it. But it's also a very diverse fleet. Um, everything, it's a mix of everything, typical of, of most municipalities. It's a mix of, of, uh, of mobile equipment, uh, everything from ATVs to road graders to sweepers, et cetera, uh, equipment, uh, every type of vehicle you can find from class one cars, light duty passenger vehicles, up to big class eight aerial trucks and pumpers and, and snowplow equipment. Next slide, please. Um, this slide will give uh, a bit of a uh, perspective on the, the, the fleet mix. Um, it's uh, you know, very uh, heavily in uh, a lot of mobile equipment, um, but buses, uh, a lot of pickup trucks, which is pretty typical for municipal fleets, um, trucks, uh, medium and heavy duties, cars, trailers, you name it. It's, it's, it's um, uh, a smorgasbord. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
Um, just a quick snapshot of baseline statistics for the fleet. Uh, in our review, there were 492 units, which included vehicles and mobile equipment. The original purchase price, the asset purchase price, when vehicles were bought, that may have been five or one or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. From their original purchase price, there's $61 million, $61.7 million. The current day or depreciated value would be about $28 million, $28.2 million. But today's replacement value, based on the time value of money, uh, replacement value today would be in the order of $78 million. Uh, it's also, to put it into perspective, I think important to realize that your fleet traveled almost 4 million kilometers, which is approximately 100 times around the world in one year. Uh, it used uh, a million and a half liters of fuel and repair costs. Um, now, uh, I just want to point out these numbers in terms of dollars will not match your operating budget. These are controllable operating costs. So we only measure, um, to make our benchmarking apples to apples, we only measure things that are uh, applicable to all fleets. So that would be fuel, repairs, uh, maintenance, the cost of capital, um, those things that fleet management can have direct control of. Uh, we don't, um, because there's so many variables, we don't take into consideration facilities costs or insurance costs or um, you know, things that, that cannot be controlled by the ground level fleet management. Um, CO2 emissions for the fleet uh, were 3,855 metric tons of uh, CO2 equivalent. Um, that was measured at the tailpipe. And uh, the average age of the fleet was 8.3 years. Next slide. Um, so we, we parsed the fleet out, uh, the overall fleet or the broader fleet into the four sections that I talked about earlier. So looking at the works and transit sections, we um, undertook a normalizing exercise with 12 other fleets from our database, all in southwestern Ontario. And um, what, um, because there are variances in the numbers and types of vehicles and the different services that are provided by the fleets, um, just an example of that, some fleets uh, do not uh, may, or may outsource waste pickup or refuse pickup. Um, so to normalize that, we uh, did an indexing to try to match the fleets up with the most closest comparators. And we did an indexing system uh, based on the number of medium and heavy duty trucks and so on. Uh, we found that uh, for fleet works and transit, the um, uh, closest comparator was almost identical in its operating cost per kilometer. Next slide. Looking at paramedics, we found paramedics fleet. Uh, there were operating costs of the three other comparisons. Uh, they were the uh, lowest of the three. And next slide, please. Looking at the police section, uh, we found that uh, average operating uh, expenses uh, were the lowest of three peer fleets, but the cost per kilometer were at the midpoint for the three peer fleets. Next slide. Um, again, I mentioned stakeholder uh, surveys. Uh, we distributed surveys to a management group. A second survey was for the actual drivers and the operators equipment. And it was clearly communicated to all survey recipients that responses were confidential and anonymous and they were encouraged to express their opinions freely. Next slide. Um, so uh, needless to say, we, we uh, as this slide demonstrates, we learned that uh, on qualitative uh, basis, there was a very high level of satisfaction with the CKL Fleet and Transit Services Department. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, from our report, we produced 21 uh, key recommendations. Uh, um, and you know, among those 21, there are a number of sub recommendations as well. Uh, this report covers eight of those uh, key recommendations. Next slide. Um, we performed life cycle analysis. Um, as the slide depicts, um, life cycle analysis uses historical operating costs and performance data to establish the right time to replace vehicles. Next slide. Um, so uh, what's important in this is that capital investment and fleet modernization is critical. Uh, as all of us know, whoever, who have ever owned a vehicle, as vehicles get older, they get less reliable and they cost more to operate. Um, it's just the way it is. But that said, if vehicles are replaced too soon, value is lost. So that's the importance of life cycle analysis. Next slide. Uh, so we analyzed every category of vehicles in the fleet. Uh, we learned that some vehicles um, 
there should be a reduction in life cycles that practices uh, that are being ex um, practiced today. And in some cases, uh, vehicles could be extended, life cycles could be extended. Next slide. Um, we then use the data from life cycle analysis to plot the long-term 15-year go forward capital replacement plan. Um, you can see there are a number of spikes. Uh, the blue spike on the left is fiscal year 2020 when the research was done. Uh, what that's telling us is that there are a lot of vehicles that have not been replaced that are actually due for replacement at this time. We're suggesting that there should be some catch up spending. Next slide. Um, our best practices review covered uh, 15 different key areas of, of management practices in the fleet. Next slide. Um, so the, the key recommendations are, first of all, the, the, the fleet uh, management folks do not have a suitable fleet management information system. Um, we think this is the, the first recommendation and the most important recommendation. It, there needs to be a data system, one that takes into consideration all of the four fleets, the four subsections, and to allow management decisions. There's nothing in place right now. It's basically, I mean, uh, fleet management has put together a number of workarounds and a number of systems, but getting them all into one fleet management system is, is absolutely critical of the highest importance. Next slide. Um, we think that a charge of back system that uh, passed the costs of ownership over to the end users of the vehicles uh, should be implemented. Uh, a cost recovery system that would fund a, um, uh, a fleet reserve fund and uh, offset the cost of operating the fleet. And we think the service level sh agreement should be developed between fleet and the user groups to establish the standards of service and define expectations. Next slide. Um, we think that costs for the fuel uh, and any at-fault accidents and any negligent damage costs should be passed through costs to the user departments and therefore bestowing the responsibility for those things onto the people that are actually responsible for the people that are driving them. We think that's really important. We think that a total cost of ownership should be used when tendering for new vehicles as to buying the lowest cost, which is not the wisest choice. We elaborated on that in our report. And we also think that the vehicle standardization is recommended and there are multiple benefits that come and cost savings that are associated with vehicle standardization. Next slide. Um, a fleet, uh, the, the city has experienced for the past number of years a, an issue around attracting talent at the garage floor level. Fleet technicians are, um, are challenging to um, attract and retain. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, we think that the pay scale is not aligned with the realities in the industry. It's about either between $9 and $12 under um, pay scale. Uh, we think that uh, some further research should be done on that. Um, attracting around the issues of attracting talent, we think that an, uh, an apprenticeship program would be recommended. Next slide. Um, we looked at the issue of consolidating maintenance practices. So bringing, bringing in home, bringing the subfleets now, meaning fire and, tra uh, fire and uh, paramedics and police who are now outsourcing most of their work or much of their work, bringing it in-house. Um, first of all, with the technician shortage, that is not something that could happen, but uh, we analyzed that data. We looked at the uh, maintenance demand and the labor demand for all of the fleets together and we matched it to the current um, availability of labor and found that there's a gap. Um, however, the, when we did boiled it down and looked at the cost premium for outsourcing, we found that the business case uh, to either adding new facilities for doing fleet maintenance or adding a second or third shift and the additional personnel and expenses that would come with that, there doesn't appear to be a business case for bringing the work uh, back in house. It, at this time, at this volume, and these fleet sizes, it, there's a very, very thin case, if in any at all, to insource the repairs that are now uh, being handled outsource, uh, to outsources. Um, next slide. Um, so there are 21 full recommendations, and uh, it, um, uh, there's, it's a long time span to implement all of these if the uh, decision is to go forward. But if uh, the decision is, um, 
um, to go ahead with our recommendations or many of them, uh, it would lead to balancing the capital budgets over the next 15 years based on return on investment in the assets. It would optimize the fleet assets, extract maximum value from each unit. It would mitigate the fleet size increases. It would align labor and garage bay requirements to the maintenance the, to actual demand. Uh, we talked about safety and safety considerations in our report. Uh, it would reduce vehicle uh, collisions and protect CKL's very valuable government safety rating, which is all important. Uh, and it would optimize the fleet maintenance and the spare uh, parts inventory. It would ensure vehicle compliance and it would provide a pathway to viable cost-effective green fleet, low carbon solutions, including electrification of the fleet. Next slide. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, that was a lot of information in a quick period of time, so thanks for running through that. I'll just get a motion to receive the presentation, and then we'll see if there's any questions for you, sir. Uh, Councillor Elmsley, you'll move that. Seconded by Councillor Dunn. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for anyone? Councillor Elmsley, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you uh, to Mr. Smith. <clears throat> you talked uh, laterally in your slides about uh, the financing of the fleet. And it was my impression that what we were doing right now was that each department paid into a reserve fund every year based on their usage of vehicles and that when we came to purchase vehicles, we purchased them from the reserve fund. Uh, we didn't take them out of the uh, capital budget. Uh, have we changed that uh, system or uh, did I misunderstand what you said? I think Todd can probably best answer that. Go ahead, Todd. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Emsley and all of council, um, for what my business is we do all of our monies do come out of a reserve parks for example uh, public works roads all of public works they pay into a reserve um, but not all of our departments have exactly the same process and what uh, mr smith is recommending is that we all come up with a very similar process i do know that fire for example has a reserve um, but I'm not entirely sure about if what police do or what uh, our paramedics departments do. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, the other question I had was um, if we were to implement all or most of these uh, recommendations, uh, can you, did you put a dollar figure on what that would be? Uh, well, actually, um, the analysis that we did that we did is uh, um, everything that we, we recommended is based on cost benefit. So when we analyze it, we data model the outcomes. So whenever a recommendation is to, um, for example, uh, make start transitioning to electric vehicles, what we would do is we, we calculate the infrastructure investment to build a charging network and then apportion it over the vehicles that could be chosen to work on that technology. And then if we, the, the software shows um, based on the historical usage where the return on investment lies. So in fleet reviews of this type that we do, we find that particularly for municipalities uh, in, in that example, the electric vehicle example, um, very often there isn't a business case. Um, uh, you know, electric vehicles cost more. Um, you need to start building a new infrastructure. Um, so the software shows exactly which vehicles where there will be a return on investment and where there isn't. So Todd will be given that software, has that software now actually, and can actually go in and take a, take a look at that data model and find out which vehicles unit by unit will actually deliver return on investment. I guess uh, my concern was that while we can calculate a return on investment, it is generally the upfront cost that uh, hurts you 
because you have to pony up that money in the beginning. And while you may save money down the road, um, the initial investment uh, could be quite high. And I was more looking for what an initial investment might be in some of these cases in order to uh, uh, achieve this return on investment. Yeah, and if, if I can add to um, Mr. Smith's answer there through you, Mr. Mayor, um, out of the 21 recommendations, there are some of them that are, that are administrative that will um, reveal very quickly costs associated with them. So a lot of the first uh, low hanging fruit, if you will, are administrative tasks that we can perform um, at the manager, man, at the manager supervisor level. That way we can maybe get more out of our investment that we currently have um, and then bring forward, you know, some type of cost benefit analysis that will go to what Mr. Smith is talking about to, you know, the electrification of our fleet, because eventually by 2050, uh, that's the direction that we're going to have to be. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation. Thank you. I have Councillor Richardson and then Ashmore. Yes, thank you. And through you, that was where I was going with the whole electronic vehicle um, model and, you know, the big players just in the last couple of months making, you know, the changes to their business plan moving forward and you bringing this presentation. And I know TAS, which is a transportation as a service, is going to be a huge game changer coming forward, too. So I'm wondering when you're, you know, providing these life cycle analysis to us, how much is that going to have to change again? with the changes that are coming through. Um, okay, through the mayor. Um, we, part of the um, scope of our work was to, as I mentioned, to de develop uh, life cycle analysis for the current fleet. So um, we have a tool we've developed for doing that, uh, which we have transferred over to uh, Todd's department for their own use. So we're, our recommendation or one of our sub recommendations is to adapt the life cycles that we're recommending now, but continue doing them uh, every year. They should be refreshed probably every year, uh, if not sooner. And But the, the key to doing that is having a fleet management and information system. You don't have one now. So uh, Todd worked very hard and his team to put this data together for us, but you need to be able to get it like that. You need to have it at your fingertips. And, and you need to manage more in real time. And that's exactly to your point about life cycle analysis. It's, it's ever changing. So um, that, that's, that's my point, that's all I can say. So as new models come in, you need to analyze them and see if they yeah. are working out as planned. But the software that we've transferred over, the fleet analytics review software will do that data modeling to find the low hanging fruit, find the ones where there is a business mm -hmm. case, switch them first, and then you need the life cycle analysis to follow up later and make sure that things are going as planned. No, and that's a perfect answer. And that's where my question was lying is, you know, we need that first part of the segment in place first, which is collecting that data so we can move forward. So thank you for that answer. Thank you. Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through to you, to uh, Mr. Smith. Um, as you've shown there, like the biggest expense is the financing of these vehicles. Did you, or I didn't see it really in an, an in-depth analysis of, of doing um, a comparison of purchasing, financing it by purchasing it or leasing. Like for example, did you look at leasing highly depreciable items like automobiles and light duty trucks versus leasing the bigger items like the fire trucks and the plow trucks? Like, did you segregate those two types of vehicles because they do depreciate differently on a different scale? Just wondering how that worked into, into your analysis and like, what would, what would you recommend? Like, as far as we've had this discussion before um, about leasing versus buying. Yeah. And, and because we have such a big inventory here and it's a, this is a big ticket item. And what are your thoughts on that, please? Okay, through the mirror and to Councillor Ashmore and all of council. Um, quick answer. Um, well, first of all, Leasing versus buying was not part of the scope of the study that we undertook. It was very broad reaching, but it, it didn't reach that level. However, 
um, I can share with you that we've done that precise analysis for several fleets over the past decade. And uh, most recently for Mississauga Parks and Recreation. And we uh, um, uh, completed discounted cash flow analysis over the life cycle, over the proposed life cycle. And we found that there's a tremendous disadvantage to leasing uh, vehicles. Uh, you know, the, the, the plain and short, it'll cost you more. Uh, you know, if you're going to use somebody else's money, it always costs you more. Um, the, the, the problem is um, leasing companies or commercial lease less orders like ARI or PH&H or Element Financial, any of the big commercial fleet leasing companies, they all compete on interest rates. They'll offer very, very attractive interest rates. But where they make the money is just like banks at your, your local bank. They make interact fees, they make check fees, they make you know, service charges and things like that. And, and the list goes on and on. They have so many little embedded charges that, uh, that the, the, this is their profit that they make. But long and short, when you do, uh, uh, when in the past where we've been engaged to do this type of work, uh, Mississauga Parks, for example, their example of renting versus leasing versus owning 68 um, uh, pickup trucks for their uh, parks uh, would have cost them two, almost $300,000 a year to lease versus using their own capital. I, I don't- Thanks. Yeah. It, and just I'm sorry, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, if I could also add to that, to what um, Mr. Smith has said. Um, annually, I usually provide um, some in-depth um, analysis to Director Robinson on leasing, renting, ownership benefits. And for the past uh, three years, I've done this on some of our um, bigger equipment, such as the all of our yellow equipment, such as graders, loaders, backhoes. And as Mr. Smith has stated, it's always come back to a greater benefit, usually about to the tune of somewhere in the 40% savings range uh, that the city saves over ownership compared to rental or leasing. So just to give you some further information, uh, Councillor. And as far as the ownership, did we not look into, have we looked into buying, we always buy new, but can we not look into buying um, used equipment? I mean, newly used equipment. Would that not save a lot of money in depreciation fees over the years and cash flow? Todd, do you want to tackle that one? Yep, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Ashmore and to all of Council. Um, one of the things that we do consider, particularly now when it comes to our off-road equipment, and I say off-road being graders, loaders, backhoes, uh, graders in particular is um, something that we, we specify out now as nearly new uh, lease coming off of lease. Uh, the term that I use that I get laughed at uh, regularly for is gently used if there is such a thing. Um, but that's one of the criteria that, that we look for. Um, there is some savings uh, when it comes to purchasing them. Unfortunately, with the purchase of a gently used piece of equipment, we tend to buy uh, longer warranties simply because it's been somebody else's for the first few years and we don't we're not entirely sure how well it was maintained so we take on some of the maintenance costs at the very beginning of uh, of this purchase so we've also found that initially while the initial cost may be uh, lower sometimes depending on how well it was maintained previously our operational costs may increase okay, thank you Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, go ahead. And uh, just, can you hear me? Yes. Just, just a quick one, um, either to Todd or to Roger. Uh, as we move forward with the um, uh, with the going to the electric model, we're going forward uh, in summer, most or uh, whatever part of the fleet. Uh, what kind of infrastructure costs, or do we know that is that uh, is that going to be a fairly significant infrastructure costs uh, going forward, or have you done any of this in your background work? Yeah, yeah, th uh, this this is exactly what we do. Um, just um, okay, um, electric. The, the just to back up a little bit, municipal fleets like yours are the ideal candidates for electrification. Um, they're returned to base and they're operated in the daytime and they're low kilometers. They're, you know, they're driven not many kilometers. 
So they're, they're the ideal candidates. That, um, that said, um, and not all of them will deliver return on investment as I talked about earlier. But as far as infrastructure costs, level two chargers are what you would need. So a level two charger, based on your usage patterns on average in your fleet, would fully recharge the batteries overnight, every night. A level two charger, one charger can be shared by two vehicles. The cost is about $2,500 to $3,000. It, it's really insignificant. Now, as you get into higher demand, uh, like transit, for example, transit could really benefit from the electrification. And we've all seen the news, transit um, or net transit companies are all across Canada, everywhere around the world are electrifying. Uh, we just finished doing Saskatoon, the four, you know, their transit uh, business case. But anyway, um, when you get into high voltage or DC fast charging, it gets quite expensive. So the first thing that needs to be done is a site assessment to find out if you have sufficient capacity uh, to go into level three charging, should you decide to go that way. And then the next thing is to find out about things like trenching and uh, you know, how far the cable runs have to be and the, the transformer capacity, all that stuff. There's a whole can of worms there that has to be figured out. But on average, level three chargers can be anywhere from 50,000 to about 200,000. So it, there can be a sizable investment. So you want to make sure, you know, pilot test first uh, to, make sure, um, uh, to make sure that there is going to be a return on investment. Uh, just as a, a little factoid, uh, in the transit world, about 50,000 kilometers a year is the break-even point. That's the sweet spot where electrification starts paying off in the transit world. So as you move into level three charging, it can get quite costly. So you need to do it in numbers. Um, the other part of our recommendations include look for grant opportunities. Go to FCM. Um, Natural Resources Canada just, uh, just unfortunately just wound up a funding opportunity for infrastructure for level three chargers. Um, they may open that window again, I don't know. I'd be watching that. Uh, that's why I've recommended to Todd to keep an eye on that. Um, uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Green Municipal Fund. There, are, there may be some funding opportunities to, to start putting your network in. But the key thing in the recommendations, I wouldn't hesitate. This is not the time to hesitate. As um, previously was uh, uh, mentioned in, in the question period, was that you know um, fossil fuel vehicles are an anachronism. They're fading out just like cassette tapes. Like they're in 15 years from now, people will laugh at gas-powered vehicles. And another point in that is that this is a time to really watch the asset base. Um, I would strongly recommend extending life cycles now rather than in investing in more gasoline and diesel powered vehicles. Because a fleet of gasoline and diesel powered vehicles 10 or 15 years from now is gonna be virtually worthless. Nobody's gonna want them. So, you know, it, this is the time to start the transition. To answer your question, start with level two chargers. The, it's an insignificant investment. And then start as the, as the numbers of vehicles start building up of electric vehicles, uh, start looking at level three to quick chargers. That'll charge a, a you know a, a passenger vehicle in ten or fifteen minutes and a and a bus in a couple hours. Thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Smith or uh, Todd Bryant? Uh, Councillor Dunn, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, all this talking about charging is, and it came, comes to an article that I read. Um, vehicles, uh, these charge in their vehicle. Uh, what's the capacity of the hydro infrastructure to um, to accommodate that? That that's that's uh, yeah uh, yeah uh, through the mayor to the councilor. That is the question, um, you know, and and as and as and a site assessment really needs to be done. You know, we, we, I, don't, I don't have those kind of answers, but certainly there needs to be a qualified professional go in and, and do a site assessment. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's on the world's eye right now. The world is electrifying. So, um, you know, if you don't have capacity in your area and in, in, in where vehicles will be domiciled, then it, it needs to get on the table. <laughs> it, it, needs to be on, it needs to be on the agenda very soon. Yeah, because I read an article once about uh, Colburn Street decided to buy an electric vehicle. The hydro capacity on Colburn Street, the infrastructure won't, won't support it. 
Uh, now, whether or not that's true is immaterial, but it's just the fact that the conversation and, um, it, you know, uh, I've seen pictures of um, diesel powered charging stations, which to me is great. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, I like the idea of, um, of um, uh, going hydro, but by the same standards, um, there's a lot of hidden costs that I'm not aware of, and I would, um, yeah. I would like to see them addressed if possible. Yeah, um, just a couple things, um, just to, to bring it home to my own example. And, and uh, you know, I, I've driven an electric vehicle for a very long time now. Uh, my most recent electric vehicle is a 2020 um, Chevrolet Volt, uh, Volt B-O-L-T, fully electric. Mm -hmm. uh, that car is just over a year old now. It has about 25,000 kilometers on it. In that year, I've maybe three or four times used a public charger. The rest of the time is charged right into my house in the same plug. I could plug my phone in and charge my phone in overnight. I, I've never had a need for only three or four times have I ever had to use a fast charger. And uh, it, so, you know, 22,000 kilometers in a year is far more than your vehicles drive. Your drive vehicles drive half that a year. So your, your charging demand is going to be really, really low. Um, there are also innovative solutions coming. Um, there are solutions right now. Um, there's, a, there's a company that is selling uh, plug and play charging stations. They'll deliver it to your lot. It's solar powered. It charges all day long in the sun, has a storage battery, and it'll charge vehicles all day long. And you don't, it's, it's not even connected to the grid. So there are all kinds of neat solutions emerging practically every day. Okay. I'm, I, I'm good with it. It's just that um, uh, it, it's questions like, so we, we rent a charging station. What does it cost us to rent a charging station? Like it, it's one of those conversations that has to be had in, in a, in a uh, uh, field and what we can do today. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions uh, for either? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. I'll call the question. All in favor? That motion is passed. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Appreciate you uh, doing the report and sticking around for the questions. I know we're going to deal with the report that goes with this, a uh, report by Todd Bryan um, regarding the fleet. Fleet service report FL 2021-001 fleet services review be received and that this recommendation be brought forward to council for consideration at the next regular council meeting. Uh, most of the recommendations that you're hearing from the consultant are part of the report and the work plan to roll them out is kind of laid out in there. Uh, will you move that, Councillor Yo? Was that your, uh, was that your hand? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Yo, seconded by Councillor Richardson. Any questions for uh, Mr. Bryant, Todd Bryant, regarding the report? Okay, I'll call the question then. All in favor? That motion is passed. Thank you. Okay, we'll move into item 6.6, .6, which is a presentation on private docking on city land, proactive enforcement plan presentation. I've got uh, Sherry Dyer. Are you doing the presentation, Sherry? Or Robin, I saw you pop up there. So whoever, uh, welcome. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, it's... Um my pleasure to introduce Sherry, okay. uh, who will be giving the presentation today. Um, however, uh, before she starts, I wanted to ground her presentation in a little um, bit of history um, uh, that I, I'm certain that council re will remember. And that is that um, the city passed an encroachment bylaw in 2018, which prohibited private individuals from placing their structures on city land without a city agreement or city license. And at the same time, the city passed a docking policy which would allow people to put their docks on the city land, which has been occurring in many places throughout the city. Um, but the license was subject to some conditions as set out in the policy. At that time uh, and prior uh, to the passing of the encroachment bylaw and the docking policy, there are only two areas in the city that the city was regulating uh, docks on its property and that was Kenstone Beach Road or uh, 
County Road 24 at, at the location of Kenstone Beach, as well as, um, and that was about 16 docks there, as well as about 200 docks on Hazel Street in Thurstonia. And one of the concerns expressed by council as well as members of the public that were being regulated is that, um, that the city should be rolling this out citywide uh, where there is um, an issue uh, with docking on, on city land. And that usually happens, uh, almost exclusively happens uh, where there is uh, either some city roadway beside um, the docking uh, or there's limited space. So what we've brought to you today uh, in which we committed to bringing last year um, uh, and we're a little bit delayed because of the pandemic, unfortunately, but what we are bringing to you today is that proactive enforcement plan that we promised. Um, and Sherry will take you through areas that we have identified um, as being high conflict areas and then addressing uh, those through bringing those places, uh, those areas into compliance with the docking policy and getting those areas licensed. So I will, um, I will uh, turn it over to Sherry after mentioning that following today, uh, there will be a public consultation period through Jump In that will run from March through the summer and into September. The, the um, recommendations that are set out in the report uh, on the agenda will be uh, brought back in September for council to consider. So I will now turn it over to Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Robin. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is the proposed proactive enforcement plan for private docking on city land. And next slide, please. So we're gonna look at the areas that will be affected by proactive enforcement and also provide the rationale behind the decision for that and look at the areas that will not be affected by proactive enforcement and we'll provide um, visual imaging to uh, show you why those decisions were made and the docks or the properties that are going to be uh, affected by the proactive enforcement will also be subject, will probably be also be subject to Trent Severn waterway restrictions and all of them will be required to comply with the City of Forth Lakes requirements. Next slide, please. So the pro prohibition against placing your dock on city property will apply citywide. However, that uh, enforcement is going to be focused on areas with neighborhood conflict over access to water with a view to reduce, reducing and eliminating that conflict. We're also going to look at high risk areas, such as the areas where there's a traveled road present, then that it can potentially affect the structural integrity of the road. Next slide, please. So the city has many places where citizens are able to access water. We have shoreline road allowances and road allowances leading to water, as well as water access blocks. So you can see in the picture at the top that there are two docks present in this picture and they're approximately six feet wide, which is in accordance with Trent Severn waterways restrictions, which we'll go through later. And then we would like to see 10 meters separation between the docks in order that a vessel can be brought up onto the shore, also in compliance with Trent Severn waterway restrictions. Uh, next slide, please. So this diagram shows uh, the difference between front lot owners and back lot owners. So in this picture, the front lot owners are outlined in green and the back lot owners are outlined in red. And then there's a road in front of the front lot owners and the dock space is shown in blue in front of those. So you can see that if we were to allow back lot owners to have docks, it would more than double the load that this uh, water area would be required to hold dock wise. Next slide, please. So this area, it's actually Avery Point Road that's shown here, but you can see that there is an area outlined in green behind the properties. This is a shoreline road allowance, but it's not a traveled road. And then in front of the properties, the piece outlined in red is also a shoreline road allowance, but it contains a traveled road. And you can see some docks coming out off off some of the properties there. So the preference would be for these dock owners to relocate their docks 
to the area in the back. The area in green there that we would like them to locate in has already been approved by the land management committee for sale. If the per person really was set on keeping their dock in the red area, then we could look at whether where they're located fits the restrictions that would be in place. So that would be things like whether the, the traveled road, we could retain enough that we could have the traveled road and all the required infrastructure and still sell some land to the landowner. Next slide, please. The picture on the left is Trent Canal and the picture on the right is Lindsay and that Skugog River there. These are both traveled waterways. So we would not like to see docks in these places in order to ensure the safety of the boats traveling through. There's just not enough room in either of these areas to have docks there. Next slide, please. So the areas that we've eliminated, or sorry, <laughs> identified that would be uh, eligible to be taking part in the proactive enforcement are in wards one, two, three, and six. And the neighborhoods that have not been identified for proactive enforcement are in wards four, five, seven, and eight. And this is based on the criteria of increased risk and also conflict. Next slide, please. The only area identified in Ward 1 is that of Lake Dalrymple Road and the area that we'd be licensing is shown outlined in red here and this would accommodate approximately 65 residents. Next slide please. This is the only area that's uh, been identified in Ward 2 and this is the one Robin was speaking about. This is Kenstone Beach Road. So there are currently licenses in place here and they're set to expire on December 31st, 2023. This is a unique area. The docks are affixed to the, tra the traveled road, the road allowance, which is obviously owned by Kawartha Lakes. However, portions of the lake bed are privately owned. So unless the city is able to negotiate some sort of agreement with the private owner of those pieces of the lake bed, we would be unable to continue licensing. Next slide, please. There are three areas identified in Ward 3, which are Long Beach Road, Grove Road, and Hickory Beach Road. Next slide, please. So this is a visual showing Long Beach Road. The area that would be licensed is outlined in red, and you can see that there are two breaks in it, so it's actually shown in three different sections, and that's because some of the, of the, the area here has been previ previously sold. So the, I mentioned earlier that one of the conditions to make it so that we can sell a road is we have to be able to retain enough that we would have the road as well as all the related required infrastructure, which is ditching and hydro. And also there has to be no, or at least limited erosion concerns. So generally you have erosion concerns where the drop from the edge of the land to the water is, is steeper. So, in this area, we, we felt that it was okay to sell some. However, if they choose to license here, then this area would accommodate approximately 25 residents. Next slide. So this shows a portion of Grove Road. Grove Road is actually a very long road. Um, so some of the areas in Grove Road, we would be able to sell, but some would require to be licensed for the reasons that have been outlined already. I don't have a number of the citizens that would be accommodated through the docking policy in this area because we haven't looked in it to de determine how many properties can be sold and how many can be licensed. Next slide, please. This is Hickory Beach area. It's another unique area. We actually have an agreement with a citizens or residents association that is set to expire on May 31st of 2023. We've had some of the residents here reach out to us expressing concern over the way that the residents group is handling the area, talking about things like the fact that they feel the shoreline is overcrowded and that they feel there's inequity in who has been allowed to have docks here. We have also had Trent Severn Waterway reach out to us 
expressing concern because there were works being done over water without a permit. And when Trent Severn Waterway reached out to the residents group, they told them that they were allowed to do that because they had an agreement with City of Kortha Lakes. So I did assure Trent Severn Waterway that that is not true, that the, re the requisite permits would be required if work was being done. So the next slide, please. Ward six has three different areas that have been identified to um, come into compliance. So we have Hazel Street in Thurstonia, Cedar Glen, and then Rose Street and Jesse Avenue in Pleasant Point. Next slide, please. So the picture on the left shows an overview of Hazel Street and the strip that's being licensed is identified in red. And as Robin mentioned, we are currently licensing approximately 200 docks in this area. And if it comes into client compliance with the proposed policy that will reduce the number to 62 docks. We had a problem in this area with a building permit, unsafe building, uh, order on uh, boat like boat house here, sorry. And the municipal law enforcement group ended up having to expend $23,000 out of their budget in order to remove that boat house and um, remediate the land. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, just a portion of Hazel Street. The front lot owners are again shown in green and the back lot owners are shown in red. And the black area is the area where the docks that um, are owned by those particular properties are located. So you can see that some of those back lot owners have quite a distance that they have to travel in order to get to their docks. And in the past, it's been expressed to us by other residents in the area that the vehicles tend to be left on the road while the residents enjoy the beach and it results in traffic congestion on a very narrow road. Uh, next slide, please. This area is Cedar Glen Road. This is not actually in city ownership due to an error with the land registry office. It is a street that was on a subdivision plan, so it should have come into city ownership, but that did not happen. So we're currently working to rectify that. Uh, this area would accommodate approximately 11 licenses. Next slide, please. So this is Jesse Avenue. It's also known as Rose Street. So Rose Street is the traveled road that you can see running behind, or well, it's in front of the properties, but it's to the lower part of the slide. And then the Jesse Avenue is outlined in red. And Jesse Avenue is a well-used walking path. There's also a steep drop in this area from the edge of the land to the water, meaning we have erosion concerns there. And for both of those reasons, we would not be open to selling this strip of land. Uh, that This uh, area would accommodate approximately 27 licenses. The edge uh, of the part outlined in red, so around number 67 and 69 there, it's the reserve after that. And that's a similar issue to the one that we have in Cedar Glen. So we are currently working to bring this piece into city ownership. And unfortunately, I don't know how many additional docks that that means the, the policy would accommodate. Next slide, please. All the docks that are approved to come into compliance with this program would also be potentially subject to Trent Severn Waterway restrictions. So Trent Severn Waterway prefers floating docks and docks supported on legs to crib docks or concrete docks. These structures are to be secured to the shore and shall be installed above the upper controlled navigation level. The maximum width of a dock is eight feet and the maximum width of the fingers and the access ramp is not to exceed six feet. The first 10 feet from the shore must be left open for fish. Boat lifts must be located within or adjacent to the specified dock with an open design. Gazebos on docks are not permitted. Installations are not permitted during mid-March to June 30th, and this is to accommodate the fish spawning season, and only one dock per lot is allowed. Next slide, please. This is an illustration of those Trent Severn Waterway restrictions I was just speaking about. You can see that the access ramp 
is only six feet. And that is the piece that extends from the shore to the remainder of the dock. Then the dock after that access ramp can be eight feet wide. And this particular illustration shows two fingers coming out from that dock, both of which are allowed to be six feet wide maximum. Next slide, please. The city has tried to mirror the Trent Severn waterways where they can, but we also have additional restrictions. So the city requires insurance in order to, um, in case, sorry, in case we have any, in order to limit our liability in case we have trips and falls or any accidents on the docks. We have an annual licensing fee and that's in order to uh, help with the cost associated with the administration of the dock policy. These docks are meant to be, or the licenses are meant to be for the exclusive use of the structure only, not the shoreline and the water. And historically staff has had issues with the license agreements being perceived as ownership and the people that have the licenses limiting the other public's access to the water. So that's an important part of the dock policy is that we would make it clear that the license is only for the use of the structure. We do not allow alteration of the vegeta vegetation or trees and that's to help uh, ensure this, the integrity of the road. Where there's a change in ownership, the city requires notice in order to avoid lapses in insurance. And once the docking licensing has been completed, we will assign a sign and the licensee has to post this on their structure. And that reduces the chance, it eliminates the chance that municipal law enforcement are going to remove a structure that has already been licensed. Next slide, please. The city also requires a three meter setback from the traveled roadway. And this is to ensure safety and also for maintenance reasons such as ditching and snow removal and snow storage. Uh, we do not allow for the docks to exceed six feet in width. And this is to mirror the Trent Severn waterway requirements. And any structures that come out of the water are not to be stored on the road allowance unless all items being stored can provide three meters clearance from the traveled roadway. We require 10 meters spacing between docks. And again, this is to mirror the Trent Severn waterway requirements that it, there must be the availability for a vessel to come ashore in between the dock structures. Next slide, please. These are just some pictures to show what we have been talking about. This is a picture of a permanent dock structure, structure, which is more to the right, and then also a dock that has been removed and stored on the road allowance for the winter. So you can see that there is not three meters setback from the road here. This dock was in place before we began doing the licensing. And there, this is where we have safety concerns and also less ability for road maintenance. Next slide, please. These two structures were built right beside the road. So the road actually runs right underneath what you see in the picture. And the problem here is that there are erosion concerns underneath these structures, which affects the integrity of the road. Next slide, please. These are two structures that wouldn't be permitted by Trent Severn Waterway. So the structure on the left shows a multi-level deck which Trent Severn Waterway wouldn't approve. As we stated earlier, they allow the access ramp and the dock itself, but there is no mention of any sort of multi-level structure. The picture on the right shows where a seating area has been placed atop a boathouse and Trent Severn Waterway would not approve that either. Next slide, please. This is a picture, this was a structure that had a roof, but no sides. It was actually the old marina uh, on Hazel Street. And during a windstorm, it came in and picked the roof up off the building and deposited it into the road. And the hydro was taken out by that. And the residents in the area were without hydro for several days. And so that's the end of my presentation. And I would welcome any questions. Careful what you wish for, Sherry. Um, thank you for the presentation. That was uh, well laid out, well done. Um, certainly have some questions I do myself. I see lots on the screen. So let's get a, 
Let's get a motion to receive, and then we'll go from there. Councillor Seymour Fagan and Councillor Elmsley. Uh, questions, Councillor Seymour Fagan, and then Councillor Elmsley. Go ahead. Hi, thank you, Sherry, for this. I know how much work has gone into it and how much unraveling you've had to do. So, so thank you. I really appreciate it. So the one on Ken Stone, um, it, it's a strange one, right? So we own the land, but the actual water, so the sand and everything under that is not owned by us. Is that correct? Some of it, just some of it. Portions of it are privately owned and some of it we do own. But for the so, portions that are privately owned, we would have to come to an agreement with the landowner. Okay, and I know that you guys have been trying to come forward and, and get the landowner to, to work with you. So, so yeah, so thank you very much on that because I know it's a very strange one. And yeah, you've done a lot of work. So thank you, much appreciated. You're thank welcome. you. Councillor Elmsley, you. go ahead. And then I have a couple of questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> and thank you for the presentation. Um, I am totally opposed to this whole activity. I think we are setting ourselves up for just a huge blowback and we are entering into an area that is really sensitive to uh, people who have been in their uh, cottages, homes, whatever, in some case for many, many generations and have used the facilities and uh, have done major upgrades. Yes, they're not on their property. I, I understand that. But here we are, we're, we're about to disrupt whole neighborhoods. I'll point to the Grove Road as one. We have people on the Grove Road who came forward and asked to buy the property across from them and they were turned down by the land management committee. And the reason they were turned down was they were told, well, we may have to do maintenance on the road. But at the same time, Public Works is telling us, well, we shouldn't be doing any work on that road because it's an unassumed road and we're going through whole changes down there in order to uh, meet public works uh, uh, rules and regulations in order to comply to get a limited service agreement on that road. At the same time, we have one person who was successful in negotiating a lease with the city for the property across the road where they have a large boathouse, by the way, and they now have a lease, but it took three years to get the lease in place. So if we're going to sell property or we're going to lease property, we're gonna to have to do it more efficiently or none of us will be here uh, when any of these things uh, start to come to fruition. The whole issue down on Long Beach Road is, is a travesty. And, and you talk about places where we have uh, people uh, fighting and arguing with each other. I'm not aware of any on the Grove Road. I'm aware of one on uh, Long Beach Road that has to do with private property and whether the property is private or a public beach. And I think that that's since been resolved. So I, I really think that this is just uh, a terrible situation that we're embarking on and to try and get it uh, to be enforced and to change people who have been doing things for decades and maybe generations is to me, um, well, they look at it as a money grab from the city, number one, and then we're going to put so many restrictions on them with the Trent Severn restrictions and other things, and it doesn't make sense. Uh, sorry, I will never support this. Thanks. And your question was okay. I got it. We get we get your message. I got a couple. I got you, Councillor Ashmore, and then done. But let me go first. Um, I got a couple. I've got you, Councillor Don. I've got you on the list. Let me just uh, ask my question first, if I can. So. Um, 
the odd time I do agree with Councillor Elmsley in a certain way. Um, so I think my question is more directed toward Robin. So Robin, when we had this discussion, I guess the last term of council when we put, you know, the whole issue of licensing docks and, you know, licensing a road allowance, um, I, I supported moving forward with the proposal because to me it was about, you know, the liability, you know, where people have docks on city property, we don't know if they have insurance, uh, they don't have exclusive use to that property, they think they do, you know, are we putting other residents at the municipality at risk because, you know, we can't guarantee that they're insured if something happens. Examples were brought forward of things that have happened in other communities. That, that makes sense to me. What I think is happening here, and I don't know enough of the details, but it seems like, in, and it's just my opinion, we're, we're going too far. And I, I really think we need to step back and just where's that happy medium where we can go back to controlling the liability on public, you know, um, you know, making sure that yes, they have to have a license. I don't think we should increase the cost. We just did that, you know, I know it's a cost recovery and you're just trying to recover those costs, but we do a 10 year or five year license. It's, it's a one time thing and it's done. But I just, I think we need to go back to, you know, minimizing the risk to the rest of the municipality uh, I don't know if you can grandfather in people who already have a dock, um, you know, but, you know, so they're not going to meet some of the criteria, but they still have to maintain it. You know, they still have to get a license. Um, if they've got a great big structure built, you know, within the road allowance, I get that that's an issue. So maybe part of their license needs to be with the understanding that if we need to do maintenance on this road, you're gonna have to remove that structure, but as part of, you know, it's grandfathered in for now. I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't have the answers. I just, you know, Councillor Elmsley makes a good point where I think we're taking something that had really good intentions and smart intentions, and now we're taking it to a step. When you start talking about removing 65 docks, you know, from an area of people that have had docks for 50 years, and enjoying their waterfront, and most of the people have bought there for that reason. I, I just, I'm, I'm not sure we're doing a good thing here, and, and I just, it's almost like we've taken what, what I thought was the original intention, and now we're, you know, now we're going forward saying we want them. I mean, I drive around some of these areas, and I look at Thurstonia and Long Beach Road, and, and some of these areas you've mentioned in here, and if you have to have 10 meters between a dock, you're gonna lose two thirds of those docks. And those people have lived like that for, for many, many years. They're all friends, they know each other. And is that really, if that's a Trent Severn criteria, let Trent Severn enforce it. I don't know if we can issue a, a, a land agreement to use the dock, but they're responsible to Trent Severn for enforcing. Why should we enforce a Trent Severn thing? Like, you know what, if, if they're okay with having a dock and they wanna have a dock and the dock beside them is, is five or six feet away, what do we care? right? I mean, the dock's been there for 50 years. Maybe you apply these new criteria, Robin, to anybody who applies for a new dock or a new license, you know, then these cr criteria seem to make sense. But to try and go back and clean this up for, for residents who have, you know, who have been enjoying their property, I, I just think we're, we're taking that original intention and we're, we're going a step that uh, I don't think I can support because I think it's just it's, it's gonna create a lot of backlash and I just, I'm not sure it's necessary. I, I just, and that's, that's just my opinion and I don't know if there's a way to sort of step back and say, you know, maybe we need to, to find a happy medium here that we can still put some semblance of control here, control new applications, uh, let people understand that they still need to get a license. 90% of the people I talk to have no issue paying a license fee no issue having insurance on their property, uh, no issue, you know, maintaining the structure that they have in the water. But at the end of the day, you know, people working hard, people are stressed out, and if they can enjoy a little bit of waterfront and we can put some criteria in place, I'm just not sure we should be uh, trying to clean up the whole neighborhood at, at a lot of their expense. So uh, I'm just gonna leave it there. I, I don't think I can support the recommendations in your report, I, I, do, I do know where they're coming from, but. I don't know if you want to comment, Robin, or if there's some way we can, that's just my thoughts. I want to hear, there's a few other questions, so let's hear from them, but do you want to comment on that, Robin, at all? Certainly, and, and I, I just want to make sure that uh, council and, and the public understand that there are areas where um, 
where we don't think that the built form, if you will, will change very much. So Grove Road being an example um, where it appears that in Grove Road, people have a dock across the street from their property or a boathouse, and that seems appropriate. Um, so in Grove Road, the concern would more be um, the fact that we maintain through a limited service agreement that road. So we would look creatively at solutions for, um, are we able to realign the road? Do we, um, you know, do, can we in some areas have longer term licenses or sales? And in other areas, we do need the people to remove a uh, strike hazard. So I walked to the road with Councillor Elmsley and noticed that there was a great variety in, in Grove Road. There were some parts where you would have a, a staircase railing right on the traveled road, which I mean, if you had a car traveling down that road and it struck that railing, guess who would be paying for that? That would be the city. So those are the kind of concerns that we deal with. And in fact, the city right now is carrying $235,000 every year in insurance costs for one strike where a car left the road and struck something that was within a three meter clear zone. So the city just can't afford, I mean, it can't afford to, to not pay attention to road safety. And so that's why the three meter setback is so important. And I understand that people are enjoying their properties and there are creative solutions that we may be able to find. We're not saying tear everything down, but we, we really, we have some difficulty with, um, with allowing structures to be right up beside a traveled road. Jesse Road, no problem. That's a walkway, people can walk and, and the, the docks can stay there. So there are areas that we've noted because they've come to you, um, but not all of them are of concern. Dalrymple wasn't a concern. Um, Long Beach was not a concern. Uh, those were set out in a one-to-one. -one. And in fact, we've sold a lot of those uh, waterfront sections. So that that's not indicating because we've highlighted it that those will be gone. The 10 meter separation was trying to give a visual cue to say between the center line of each dock, we wanna make sure there's about 10 meters because when we took um, the width of the dock, Pulling up, say, uh, like a swimming area, you'd have about tw 12 feet. And then on the other side, you're going to have your marine rail or your, your boat. So you've got to have that all together. That gave us about a 10 meter spacing. Can we get rid of that guideline? Absolutely. But what seemed to be most important to prevent overcrowding and fighting between the neighbors, because we hear it, was having uh, more than the front lot owners with their docks across the street. So where we saw that was the Cedar Glen, lots of fighting there between neighbors. Uh, we saw it in Hazel. And um, those were our really two areas where we found um, fighting. The problem with Hazel and saying, um, let's just tell people that when we need to do work, uh, we will have to remove their docks is because that's going to be a problem too. Can you imagine Hazel Street has no sidewalk? It's pretty much a one-way road. Uh, there's, there's problems with the surface because there's no ditching. When engineering has to come and do a capital project, can you imagine how difficult it's going to be to say to everybody who might have just put in a 10,000 dock as someone just recently did, put in a 10,000 dollar dock and we say to them we need to remove everything that's more cruel than saying you know what you have this five-year period but then really if you are going to be a strike hazard or your your deck you'll see some people had built sort of into the side of the road uh that you know is very expensive because it undermines the road those will have to be you know removed upon either substantial completion uh sorry substantial repair uh or when we need to come in and do the road works. So for that reason, it seemed when we were looking at this, um, almost more cruel to allow these structures to remain because of the um, it really just in Hazel Street, um, which is the biggest concern, this, the in 
incredible risk and then the inability to do things such as uh, you know, have ditches, um, have an appropriately uh, paved and, and maintained road. All of those uh, we just cannot do because um, as uh, Ms. Dyer mentioned, we can't even get ditches in because the docks are right up against the road. So um, citywide, are we gonna be um, rolling this out proactively to people who have a dock on our, on our property where there's an untraveled road allowance? Absolutely not. We've given you the whole plan. We've found everything that's a problem and we found everything that could be a potential strike hazard for, um, for licensing, but we don't see major changes outside Hazel Street, Cedar Glen, where you have those back lot owners putting pressure on the front and then the narrow road to, um, to dock issues. So, um, you know, we don't, uh, do this because we're evil spirited. We're, we're just trying to keep the municipality, the residents safe. We're trying to keep the roads safe. And, uh, and so therefore um, I don't think that increased fees are needed, but I think that the balance um, of the um, provisions with the exception of the 10 meter setback, I think um, when you look at the balance of the um, policy, you'll realize that you pretty much need to keep distance between um, is necessary. And then finally, if we say, we'll let TSW be the bad guys, and that's completely fine, but it, it does, it's going to cause problems for the residents where we issue them a license and then TSW doesn't. So we just try to marry those up rather than giving them more work to jump through two hoops. And those are all my comments for now. Thank you. And as usual, they're good ones. Thank you. Um, no, I, and you know what? I get it. I just, I guess, yeah, I, I, I've said my piece. I just, you know, I, I, I find it hard to believe we can't come up with some kind of an, a license that recognizes, you know, picture of a, a person storing their dock right beside the roadway is wrong, right? They should have to move that. I, I totally agree. You've got property somewhere, haul it across the road. I know it's a big dock. I know it's a lot of work, but put it on your own property. If you want to build a, a deck, you know, right up on the road allowance, you shouldn't be allowed to do that either. So. You know, I, I just, I, I guess I'm just trying to say they're, you know, a bit of a happy medium where, you know, one day, five years from now, we're going to be doing work on this road. You're going to have to remove that structure. So we're going to write that right into your license and you've got warning ahead of time. So you can either start adjusting it now or you're going to know that when the time comes to do work on that road, you know, this structure will be removed. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, everybody should understand that. I just, I think we're, I, I don't know, uh, it's a tough one. I just, I think we need to have some more discussion on where we go from here before we, we start putting some of these policies in place and going out to the public and seeing what the appetite is. But uh, I'll, I'll see what everybody else has to say. Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. All right, thanks. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. And I, I'll just I have a couple questions first and, uh, and a few things to say. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Elmsley for bringing that up, and he's just hit it spot on about neighborhood disruption, and that's what I've experienced certainly in the last two years. Um, so, the question, my first questions are the fees. I know fees were never really a big issue. The fees, the insurance was, but I'm looking at here in this report, and I printed the thing off, and I read it all. So, like almost 60% increase in fees. Are these fees increases going to be for the existing ones? Before I get going here, I'm going to save the save the best till two weeks from now. But anyways, we're I'm not going to keep going on all day here because we've got, only got so much time here. But my first question is the fees for existing leaseholders. Is it going to be increased by sixty percent? No. Right so, oh, sorry. Go. Uh, sorry, Sherry. Um, yeah. So if so, this is going out to public consultation, or perhaps as the mayor suggested. We'll bring another report back with some potential amendments based on hearing from you. We'll go to the public and then it would be in whatever form it's passed by you passed in September. So it would be for 2022 going forward. Everybody who has leases. So in um, Thurstonia, you have your Hazel uh, Street that's on um, a five year lease right now they would carry on with their existing um, fees until the end of their five-year term. Um, however, Hazel Street itself is slated for road work, and that is one area that I see disrupted 
by road work in the next five years. So I would imagine that that would be the only area affected by road work. Um, and therefore a lot of people wouldn't be enabled to renew because of the capital works. Uh, however, uh, Ken Stone as well is on um, a five-year license. They would carry on with their fees. And if we were able to get um, an agreement with the owner of the water lot, then we would increase, um, if that's what was in the, in the policy, their fees annually. But um, uh, if we weren't able to get those water lot um, licenses organized, then we wouldn't be able to renew because we just wouldn't have the authority to do so, not owning the waterbed. Uh, the timing, to me, the timing isn't the greatest. You know, we're bringing this out in the middle of winter and people just aren't, they're not aware of this. And that's, that's really um, a troubling thing here. On page 268 under process, it says realty services will determine which area to be licensed each year. A site visit will be completed by realty services staff to review the area and take photos to assist in determining the most likely owner of each structure. So you're saying that realty services are, are the ones that are going to be determining which area is going to be licensed each year. Is that not what council does or I'm not sure on that, but anyways. Um, and, you know, when we're getting as far as there's 20, I've got 200, I guess 250 of these uh, that I have to deal with here in the last two years I've dealt with it. And uh, not just myself, Councillor Timor Fagan had, had some as well. But just speaking for myself, like I, I'll give you an example of what really has really kind of troubled me we're bringing this on but we've got at least 20 or 25 people in the queue in thurstonia and they're so-called backlot owners or backlot people as you call them i hate that word but why why aren't they being allowed to at least be um, given first chance at getting a dog space so and this other thing i just learned this here just recently that we're going to be shrinking down from 200 we're going to shrink them down by uh, down by 60 that's going to be that's not going to be a uh, an easy thing to do so i mean to me really it should have been done on a case-by-case -case system like cedar glen it's a small area it does need some issues it does have issues um getting back to hazel street i've never seen anybody fighting there i'm not sure what that's what you're referring to but i get you know i've had a lot of um i can take it okay the people people are really mad i mean that's part of the job i've I signed up for it it doesn't bother me, but it bothers me when I see people really disrupted and they're really upset. Families are are, are upset, multi-generational families. The people get really upset and that, that bothers me. Um, but I mean, it's just, I think it's, this thing here is, you're really, you know, be prepared, Councillor Amsley and Councillor Councillor Yo, because you're going to have a busy year. I hate to have this thing inflicted upon you, but it's this is what's going to happen. And uh, I really think that this is not a good time to bring this in. You know, I, I you know, I appreciate you did the, the report and you did a lot of work into it. You did what you had to do there, Sherry, but um, I really think this is not a good time to bring this in. There's gonna be a lot of pushback, a lot of negative uh, comments on it. I know in the next two weeks, you're gonna see a lot of comments come in, but I, I really think it's not a good time to do this. Okay, so just for, cl just for clarity, if I can, Robin, uh, just for clarity, Councillor, this is forward and it was made clear that they're going to do public consultation from March to September. So it's not about the next two weeks. This is here for our conversation. If we want to change the direction, there's some new proposals here, but this was a, an encroachment bylaw and, and council's docking policy is where this whole thing started. So it's not Robin or Sherry who's driving around looking to see who they can make mad in the community. I think we're just, now we're looking at what's the next step as we go forward and try to make enforcement. So this is where saying that I don't approve any of this and I'm not in favor of any of this accomplishes absolutely nothing. So this is where we need to get conversation. How do we do this? How do we do this properly? How do we try to respect what's already out there and put something in place so that we're taking the liability off people who don't have a dock? If somebody drowns under somebody's dock on city property, the rest of the residents have to pay for it. To say that we shouldn't do anything, I mean, that's ridiculous. We have to make sure that the liability is in place to do something properly. What, we're, what we've got in front of us here is, a, is something that start a conversation, where do you wanna go from here? It's not about a conversation two weeks from now when I'm really gonna bring the bullets and have a conversation. It's 
make some recommendations on what you want to see changed here today. That's why this is that Committee of the Whole. If we want to refer it back, if we want more information, if we want to take some of these things out, let's have that conversation now, not two weeks from now at Council. Council can, if we get feedback in the meantime, but this is about recommendations that our staff are going to take out in March or April if it's not done by March. And over the course of the summer, they're going to do consultation with the public when the people who actually have docs are here and then put in place for 2022. So when you say, I'm not sure why this is coming forward now, I'm not quite sure I understand that comment. We're trying to not implement it now, but have the conversation now. And we have to have the conversation at some point. And I think that's what these guys are trying to do. I don't agree with it all either, but let's have a constructive conversation about how do we do it properly then? What's, what's the best medium that we can all maybe agree to, to, to disagree on? And it's not about two weeks from now, it's about right now. So it's here, let's have that conversation now. So did, did you have a question well, you mean, wanted to ask or? Yeah, well, if I could get clarification, like I, I know it's, I mean, we just bring it up today. We can't decide everything today. Next two weeks from today, we have our council meeting and it's gonna be endorsed, maybe, potentially. So once you endorse this, then you've set it, you've set the path for it. Okay. So that means you're, you're, you're basically, you're, you're in favor of it. So two weeks from today, we vote on this. No, I understand councillor, but we could, we could actually make a motion to refer this back to staff with some recommendations on what we would like to see done differently in this report and then have them do a bit of work and come back to us with maybe a bit of a compromise on the areas we're not happy about. That's what we can endorse at Council. We don't have to make a final decision two weeks from now. We want to make sure we get this right. That's why it's here early. It's February, for goodness sake. Nobody's worried about their dock right now. Let's have the conversation and figure this out now so that when it goes out to the public, we've actually got a viable plan in place moving forward. Um, that's what we're able to do here today. So let me go to Council Dunn and then we'll come back, Councillor Ashmore, if we have any uh, further questions. Go ahead, Councillor Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I got no questions, but I do have some comments. Number one, it's a great report. Um, I agree with you 100%. When I have rules, it's got to be the same rules for everybody, not rules for this group or that group, because that causes friction. So I think it's a good report. Now, whether or not it can be modified, sure. You've got to have the same rule for everybody. For the people that have had a 65 year pass, celebrating the fact that they have a 65 year pass pass on having their docs out there and we years. God bless them. I don't hold that against them. But they got something for nothing. And it doesn't automatically entitle them because I got it for nothing for 65 years. I should get it for nothing for the next hundred years. Putting rules in place to protect everybody. You're putting rules in place to try and see that everybody gets treated fairly and the same. So I like your report and I think it's great too, but uh, good report and thank you very much. Thank you. Any further, I'll come back to you, Councillor Elmsley. I'll just see if anybody hasn't spoken with yet. Does anybody have any, who hasn't spoken have any question? Councillor Richardson, go ahead. I guess my question right now would be to um, Robin and Sherry, because you've heard the dialogue today. Do you see any compromises that we could use today moving forward? Uh, yeah, so I, when I hear the conversation today, um, I would think it would be most appropriate to bring back a report uh, that is modified to remove the 10 meter separation, which was intended as a guideline uh, between docks and, um, and to uh, remove the fee increases. Um, I think that the concerns um, expressed by Councillor Ashmore um, might be lessened by a review of Appendix C to the report which could be added to the, um, to the policy itself. So it provides more clarity as to what dock areas will be looked at when. And so it goes through uh, all of the dock areas that Sherry mentioned today and what the plan is uh, for each area based on what we see um, as being the constraints in those areas. So, um, so I definitely see some ability to give further clarity um, and also um, 
you know, reduce uh, the financial concern. However, I do see that, um, unfortunately, there's only one or two areas um, that seem like they'll have big impacts, but there will be big impacts. And that's in the, the Cedar Glen and the Hazel Road, where we're seeing a lot of impact on the road. Uh, we're seeing a lot of overcrowding. We're seeing a lot of strike hazards. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of risk there. Um, and, uh, and so I would think that those would be areas where we would want to compromise less on. Um, well, yeah, because what I'm like, what I'm hearing right now is I can see both sides of the story. Um, and, you know, I, I do um, hear what uh, Councillor Dunn is saying. I'm hearing what the mayor is saying. Like I'm saying, if you can bring us these additional um, compromises to our next, um, for, you know, our additional report. So then we're not just making a decision today based on what we're hearing from both sides of this camp. I think we need to, I think we need to get into the middle a little bit more on this one. That's my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. And I would, I would certainly, when I said fr don't change the fees, what I meant was maybe keep the dock the same. A boathouse should be more than a dock. I totally agree. I don't think it should be a thousand dollars, but maybe it's 150 and 300 or 400, something like that. But you know, a person with a dock, a person with a boathouse is a whole different liability, a whole different. So, um, but again, uh, recommendations. Councillor uh, or Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, go ahead. Much like the previous speaker, I say there's uh, some that are affected more by others. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, Hazel Street uh, for sure is uh, is one of those, uh, uh, it's going to be a difficult one for sure with the history and people have been there for years like many of the other places as well, but that road needs to be fixed and needs to be reconstructed. I just, did we have any time frame? I don't know whether anybody has any knowledge of when that's gonna be done, but when, if they do that road properly, we're certainly going to be encroaching uh, on some of those uh, existing docks. There's no doubt about that for sure. Uh, just knowing the just knowing the road, knowing the history, but uh, just a comment. Uh, yes, we we spoke with uh, engineering, and they indicated that in the next three years, uh, that Hazel Street would need to be redone. Okay, we're just this is just to receive the presentation. We haven't even got to the report yet, so that should be fun. But Councillor Helmsy, you had a follow up. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just going to say, I too think I'm, I'm talking about fairness and that everybody should be treated the same way. And the first thing we notice about the report, it only affects three, three wards out of six, it doesn't affect the other three. So what I'm saying is if we're going to assess um, monies on docks that are on city property, it should be across all six wards, not just three. And I think that uh, there is room for compromise. Uh, I would like to see the report modified. So I agree, people who have docks should have insurance. I also agree that they that there should be a fee. So if we can go along and come up with a fee structure and not have all this other attendant uh, bureaucracy that goes with it on the size of the dock that's been there for uh, 75 years and now we're gonna make them chop six feet off it. Uh, if we can get rid of those kinds of things and just say, you have your dock on city property. This is how much it's going to cost you. And we need proof of insurance uh, that you uh, th that you're insured for this dock. Uh, and let's move on. And the things with people putting their property on road allowances, that sh obviously shouldn't be allowed. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's room for movement here. But as Councillor Dunn says, we should all be treated the same. Well, yes, we should. So it should be all six wards and not just three wards. Uh, yes, if I could uh, just provide some clarification uh, comments. So the um, the encroachment bylaw applies citywide. Docking policy applies citywide. It was only that we were able to reckon that we were only able to identify the streets and the wards 
uh, that we identified in the presentation today and that are set out in Appendix 6 as having concerns from a, a road infrastructure perspective. Um, so that's why uh, we identified them. But it, it would apply to every road, uh, every ward. It's just we didn't identify problems in those other in those other wards. And then um, secondly, in which we should make clear um, in our policy, if it's, if it's not already in there, because it is in our practice and in our template agreement, is that if somebody has a dock that's too wide um, or a structure that's non-compliant, like um, a, a double layer um, situation with seating on top, we allow them to keep what they have. And then when they have to substantially redo it, say it's got hit by a windstorm and has to be redone, that's when we ask them to redo because that's when TSW is going to require them to get a permit and go down to the smaller amount. So we don't we don't want to disrupt people who are there um, and, and chop off a, a foot or what have you. Um, so we do provide that. So we'll make sure that's clear in the policy. Thank you. So we have a motion to receive the presentation. So let's let's vote on that. Um, and then we'll go to the report. All in favor of receiving the presentation? That motion is passed. Thank you. Um, so let's, while we have them here, let's go on to the report 661. Um, what do you suggest, Robin? Do you, or, or Sherry? Sorry, I'm not trying to cut you out, Sherry. I just, um, what do you suggest? Sherry says, yes, please cut me out. Um, <laughs> Uh, Robin, what do you suggest from what the comments that you've heard here today? Can we res can we refer this back to you and 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 just you know based on the comments come back with a bit of a I don't know how do you want to word it? What what direction do you need from us from the comments you've heard and from the conversation to maybe come back with something a little more down the middle of the road? Uh, certainly. So based on uh, what I've heard today. It might be a motion uh, that the report be received and that um, the matter be referred back to staff for revision uh, and return to Committee of the Whole in March. Uh, referred back to staff for revision to consider the comments made today. Can we, can we put that in, just some of the comments that were made? Um, Absolutely. Is everybody... I think that's a good motion that gets us from a good conversation we've had here today. Councillor Ashmore, you had a lot of concerns. A lot of this is in your ward, so rightly so. Are you okay with that? And let's get uh, some revisions done. Let's get some changes. And then let's come back to Committee of the Whole in March and we can have another conversation and see if, see if we're sort of as middle of the road as we need to be. Well, I hate to say, but uh, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not okay with that. I, I, I'm not going to support it just too much stress here that's causing the neighborhoods. We don't even know what the costs are gonna be. We may have to hire like 10 people to do this. So uh, we're just opening up a huge uh, can of worms here. Like we're just, I really think we should just stop this now. Well, we've already passed a policy that that's not the case. So I, yeah. I, well, I hear I'm you. I'm not gonna promote it. So, so I agree with it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm condoning it. Okay, I'm not no, that's fine. Anymore okay. I've been through enough of this and I don't want anybody else to go through what I went through more importantly what the people went through in my ward so I don't want anything more to do with it thank Sorry. you can I get a motion to receive the report refer it back to staff uh, to uh, hear the comments we've had today and I'll come back to committee of the whole in March Councillor Dunn thank you a second by Councillor Yo. any com any questions comments I think that's Councillor Yo. go ahead Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in the report, in the uh, under the process, I think it's the process. Yeah, under the process in the in the body of the report. Um, the last paragraph in there says uh, proposed amendments further specify that any applicant who acts in a manner that is contrary to the City of Quarth Lakes Management Directive, workplace workplace violence and harassment will not be approved for a license. Um, can you explain to me the legality of holding basically private citizens under our harassment policy? Um, how does that work? So this is um, this is a discretionary service uh, that we're providing. And so for the safety of our staff, uh, we're recommending that if uh, a member of the public is, in, is engaging in a, 
in an activity that would result in harassment or violence towards our staff that we would choose not to engage with them through um, a voluntary business arrangement such as this. And it's eminently uh, responsible as an employer, uh, enforceable uh, legally, and um, I think it's the right thing to do. Okay, and understanding that, um, and I and to, to a point I agree, um, but to follow it up with, to say that they will not be approved for a license agreement, um, I think I draw the line there and, and maybe they should be um, told that they will not no longer be dealt with in, in, and they should maybe hire a third party to do the dealing if, they, if they're deemed to be uh, unworkable or, or even, even like to Ron Ashmore's point, um, even through their counselor so that they can, uh, they can voice their opinion and blow their top off at us, which happens quite regularly. And we can streamline it in through the staff and try and mediate the situation, but to just out and out say they won't be approved for a license agreement. Um, I haven't found that in the policy yet, but I know it's in the process, so it must be in there somewhere. But I'd like that to be looked at. There's got to be another way to do that, either through a third person or through a counselor or, or, or some way. And that's just my comment. So thank you. No, uh, and you know what, Robin, I think that I think that's a good comment. I mean, I think you know our, we need to protect our staff, and nobody should have to deal with somebody who's being belligerent or threatening our staff. Uh, but at the same time, you know that doesn't shouldn't necessarily preclude them from ever having a dock or a license. So maybe you can just look at a way to sort of enforce that, but but have a bit of a, a workaround if necessary to, to get where we need to be. So that, that's a good comment, uh, if you'll look at that as well. Absolutely, and, and I, would, um, I would say that people can get mad at staff. Uh, people do get mad and they're entitled to get mad. And so that's not what we're trying to, um, to stop here but we've had some concerns um, of, of physical concerns for physical safety. And, and that's where um, we just wanna make sure that we that staff feel comfortable drawing a line. So we'll definitely look at providing uh, more language around that um, to better specify uh, you know, options for people who are just angry compared to people who are um, potentially threatening staff. Perfect, thank you. So we got a motion. Uh, I'm gonna call the question. All in favor? That motion is passed, thank you. We'll get that back in March. Thanks uh, ladies for all the work you did on that and I uh, hope you're not taking these comments personally It's just what we're hearing from constituents and uh, trying to find that happy road. So I appreciate your, uh, your conversation and, and all the work you did on that, thank you. Absolutely, thank you, we appreciate the feedback. Okay. Thanks. Let's take a quick five-minute break, and then we'll come back and deal with, uh, deal with our reports. A quick five-minute break.
We're going to call the meeting back to order. We got uh, five, six. We got quorum. Uh, we're into reports. Uh, I think we can go through these pretty good. Uh, update on modernization review. Uh, Ron Taylor, there he is. Uh, he's got two minutes to give us a quick overview, and then we've got the report in front of us. So go ahead, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, through you. So the report that's in your agenda simply just provides an information update to you on a whole bunch of modernization reviews that are either happening provincially, uh, locally, or uh, very specifically, uh, you know, within our own internal uh, reviews and audits. And I know you're aware of many of them, so I won't go through all of them at length. Uh, the second re uh, recommendation or the other recommendation other than to receive the information is to just let you uh, be, make you aware that there is another funding opportunity uh, to do a line by line third party review and or uh, there's other eligibility inclusive of uh, digital modernization projects. And uh, because of the timing, uh, we received the letter for that uh, intake. We uh, provided a couple of ideas to you that we think we should pursue. Uh, they're basically recommended based on comments that some or all of you have made uh, throughout uh, the budget process uh, or leading up to the budget process. So one being uh, potentially looking at funding to expand on and accelerate our comprehensive roads inventory and doing all of the requisite work that's involved with that. The second uh, potential application, again, we need to do our homework and look a little deeper, but would be to look at uh, technology solutions and or recommendations uh, to update our water smart meter reading uh, technologies and program that we do currently. So these were two topics that I had heard uh, council express uh, at least an interest in uh, through budget deliberation. So thought they were good projects. Uh, you heard from uh, staff today and you see in the report, there's a number of again, major reviews provincially. Um, and then there are also a number of local reviews that are ongoing. So maybe I'll just pause there, Mr. Mayor, but certainly if there's any questions on any of those reviews and their status, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council, you have a recommendation in front of you, a couple of ideas. You have a different idea. You don't like those ideas. Where would you like to go? I think it uh, touches on a few things that we've heard about in the last month. Councillor Almsley. Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy with the recommendations and uh, uh, for them to go forward. Okay, so that report update on modernization review be received that staff make applications for funding through the provincial municipal modernization program intake two to complete digital modernization projects for a comprehensive roads inventory and database and a water smart meter reading technology where eligible and that this recommendation come forward to Council. You'll move that, Councillor Almsley? Yeah. Thank you. Seconded Absolutely. by Councillor Seymour Fagan. Thank you. Any comments, questions on the recommendation? Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the CAO. Um, on the, in the report, you have the words saying here, find smarter, more efficient ways to operate our business. Do we not use the Office of Strategy Management for that as well? Do they not? have a purpose in doing that, exactly that, but we're going out and getting a, a review. Do they not review as it is? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so OSM is one resource that does internal audits and reviews. Honestly, I would suggest that all of our departments are looking at an auditing and reviewing service. The recommended uh, funding that we're pursuing is a provincial program. And so they spell out the eligibility, but they also require that it be a third party uh, review that's done for those particular application based uh, audits and reviews. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the recommendation as printed? I'll call the question. All in favor? That motion is passed. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. So we'll go to item 7.2, which is an update on the Lindsay Ops Landfill Gas Generation Generator Summary. Uh, it's just a motion to receive. It's in the report. I know Brian, there he is, 
Do you want to give us a quick uh, one-minute overview, uh, Director, and we'll go from there? Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. Through to Council, I'll give you the 30-second overview. This is a, effectively a report uh, uh, reporting back to Council based on the resolution to provide a, an annual summary. So this is a, a summary of the 2020 operation of, the, of that uh, gas generator landfill. Uh, and uh, you know, just a, a general overview with some uh, some information about performance and so on. So if there's any questions about the report, I'm uh, more than willing to, to take them. Thank you, Councillor Dunn, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one quick question. The way I read it, the city saves $40,000 or something like that on an annual basis. Um, now, is that the city saving $40,000? Uh, sorry, Councillor Dunn, the, the, the last piece of that uh, message was cut off for me. Uh, oh, well, well, I read the report, it indicated, and I haven't got the page in front of me because I'm on the screen now, uh, it indicated that the city saved, I think it was um, what my uh, What my question to you is, is it the city as in city government that's saving that, or is it the city as in water, wastewater that's saving that? Uh, sorry, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the council. Uh, effectively, the, the way that the report's written there is identified that our uh, operational cost of that facility versus the generational benefit is about a $40,000 difference. Uh, council has uh, previously provided resolution as to the breakout of the cost and benefits of that facility uh, based on the usage. So the water wastewater budget consumes, I can't remember the exact breakdown, I think it was 96% to 4%. Uh, so the water wastewater uh, sees the 96 percent and the user, uh, sorry, the uh, tax base sees the 4 percent. So uh, that breakdown will continue unless council directs otherwise. Okay, I guess I didn't get the answer that I'm looking for, so I'll try one more time. Um, is water more to buy that particular hydro or that particular energy? than it would if they bought it on the open market. Uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the council. Again, so the, the, the report identifies there through the, the financial operation, uh, a net uh, benefit. So we are um, producing more energy and saving money uh, for the municipality right now. We are not doing as, as well as we have hoped in the past uh, based on uh, the, the business case. Uh, again, the, the study that was completed last year by engineering uh, to optimize that facility, there's still some opportunity there to uh, continue to improve on the performance of that facility. We hope to see those numbers continue to improve. But as of right now, uh, we are generating, uh, or sorry, through 2020 at least, we are generating more energy than we are paying to operate that piece of equipment. So, Director, ah. just if I, that's okay, if I can clarify. So, in your report, Director, it says operation of the generator currently delivers a net benefit to the city of $40,000 per year, currently. So, where does that $40,000 go? Is it going to water and wastewater budget or is it going toward the city surplus? No, it's not going towards the city surplus, it's going towards operation of the, uh, uh, again, there's a 96% of that will go to the user rate and 4% of that will go to tax base uh, based on the operational. So again, that, what that is is effectively a net uh, benefit to the, the, uh, the user rate budget uh, you know, of close to $40,000. Yep, I think that's what he was looking for. That's exactly what I was looking for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a recommendation to receive the report and that, that be forwarded to council. Does anybody want to move that? Councillor Dunn, you'll move that, thank you. Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, you'll second. Any further questions on the report for the director? Councillor Yo, go ahead. Thank you, and um, part of the, uh, when I read the report, it's the, the generator's down 170 days last year. Um, and part of the problem is the, um, to say the, uh, the quality of the methane is part of the reason. So. My question is, the report says the methane is going to get better as the years go on, but what's the life expect expectancy of the generator? Is it going to outlast the methane till we get 
good flow of methane to run the generator properly. So is is how long term is this is this project? I guess is the question. Uh, so through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to the councilor, I don't have the, uh, the the life expectancy of the generator in front of me. I know that we have uh, long term plans in place for general maintenance and also uh, you know larger scale rehabilitation of that uh, built into the plan. So um, I don't know. I mean, we're probably 20, 25 years of that piece of equipment uh, to continue to run. Um, we can look into that more or, and provide more information to council. Uh, through the 2021 report, if that's uh, if that's something that's interesting, uh, but I, I can't answer that information right off the top of my head. Okay, and maybe just a follow up, and maybe something for engineering to, to answer in the future. Is is there any way to capture and, and stockpile methane um, so that it can be burnt off in stages, so when the generator is running, it can run at optimum levels with captured methane, or is it just a flow and go kind of system? I, through you, Mr. Mayor, I can't answer that. We don't have an ability to capture and store uh, methane gas as part of our facility. We're required to uh, capture that gas and, and flare it off or use it so that the city's chosen to, uh, to uh, you know, convert that methane into energy using the generator. So if we're not running the generator, we're running the flare. Uh, again, the long-term goal here is to get that uh, generator running more efficiently. Uh, we've put measures in place operationally to reduce the number of down days of that piece of equipment. So we should see some benefits through 2021. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, again, uh, additional uh, gas collection to get uh, the generator the fuel it needs to run more efficiently. Uh, and also challenging our staff here to look at if the, and when the generator uh, does go down, is there ways to reduce and mitigate uh, purchasing uh, energy off of the grid to further reduce costs? So we're looking at a number of different things that we're gonna put in place through 2021 to drive efficiency of that generator. Okay, Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Through you to uh, <clears throat> Director Robinson. Have we, have you and staff looked at the methane digester? Uh, it's quite a, uh, it's just around the corner from us. It's on Settlers Road, the Callahans near Rayboro. They have a uh, state of the art digester on their farm, methane digester. Are we learning anything from that? Can we, can we uh, communicate with them and see how it's working for them? Maybe it'll help us. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, I'm not aware of that um, of that piece of equipment uh, uh, or how it operates, so I don't know how to respond to that. Okay, that's that's amazing that you don't know about it. It's a state of the art facility, and it's in our backyard. It's within walking distance of Lindsay, and we've never even contacted the Callahans. They they would know firsthand. Uh, they've had that for a year and a half, two years now, and it's quite an amazing uh, facility, and it uh, pumps a lot of electricity into the grid. Thank you. Are we good on the receive the report for the generator? Um, any further questions on receiving and referring to council? I'll call the question. All in favor? That motion is passed. Thanks, Director. Are you doing the um, standardization one or is Todd? I think Mr. Bryant's still online. I think he'd like to speak to it, uh, but if he's uh, unavailable, I'm, I'm more than willing to. Yeah, if, if somebody wants to give us, again, a quick two-minute overview, we'll, we'll see. It's just to receive. Uh, we'll see if there's any questions and go from there. Go ahead, Todd. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, and to all of Council, um, this report focuses on nine areas that are near and dear to my heart in, in the business that I, uh, one of the businesses that I operate here for the city. And it also includes eight attachments, so I want to apologize right at the beginning because I may have overdid it a little bit. Um, but in a nutshell, I was asked to come back to see how standardization uh, affects in the, the cost benefit analysis of it. So I tried to focus my report on three very specific things. Uh, first of all is the safety of the equipment that we provide uh, to our, all of our workers. The second thing is the services that we provide to our residents. We wanna make sure that not only can the equipment go up and down the road safely, but that we provide our services in a very efficient and timely manner according to all of our, uh, the, all of our standards out there. And then the third thing and the most important thing that I'd like to focus on is the cost benefit analysis that came from this report. So as you are well aware, I look at the total cost uh, approach of operating the equipment and the benefits that that provides not only to the city, but to all the residents as well. So 
Um, this the standardization report touches on all of those things that um, council has asked me to come back with. I'm hoping that you read it and it's really good nighttime reading material. It'll certainly put you to sleep if you're not in this business. <laughs> Thank you. I'll admit to reading part of it. Um, I, I do like the report. Uh, it, it is a motion to receive and forward to council for approval. Um, I just, I guess I have a quick question before I'll see what council. So this makes perfect, this makes perfect sense to me when you talk about the plow, you know, a, a truck, a vehicle like that with so many different variables. And when we talk about a fire, you know, fire engine or there's certain type of equipment that we're servicing, you know, WestJet's a good example of, you know, the same type of plane. They have the same parts that's standard. You know, they've, they've put that into a good business model. This makes perfect sense to me. But explain to me how this applies to pickup trucks, for instance, where we don't service them. You know, are we applying a standardization to a pickup truck, which is really not like a plow truck? You know, anybody can hop in a pickup truck and go to a park or, or go, you know, do some ditching or whatever they need to do. I mean, there's basic equipment there. But do we apply standardization to that? And, you know, is that the same kind of cost benefit? Because we're farming those out for maintenance regardless. So it doesn't quite fit the same argument as, you know, inventory, cost benefit, an, an operator having that knowledge. So can you just give me a quick overview of, you know, some of those other items in the fleet that don't necessarily fall under the same category as a, as a plow? For you, Mr. Mayor, to all of council. Um, yes, you're, you're right. It, for these types of things, and I'll give you three examples, um, which would be a standard pickup, a standard car, and a standardized van those three items that it doesn't really apply to. And when we go out for, for tenders, it, this we, we generalize our specifications so that we can encourage more people and more companies and more organizations to bid on them. Um, where standardization shows the greatest benefit is in our specialized equipment, uh, ice machines, plow trucks, uh, graders, aerial trucks, you know, those types of, um, I call them very big ticket items and ones that we don't go out for on a regular basis or go out for in mass. Um, so you're right, that's, there's benefits, but more to our specialized areas, yes. So for some of the simpler equipment, pickups, van cars, we're, when we put out a tender, we're not focusing so much on standardization, just trying to get the basics that we need and then obviously the best price possible of any maker model that fits that criteria, correct? Correct. To, to give you the, the best example, Mr. Mayor, I could give you is the specification for a pickup truck or a car is about two pages long where we're looking for gross vehicle weight rating. Um, it had to have a certain size bed, maybe four doors, those types of things, engine size or horsepower, those types of things. But a, a plow truck is much more detailed, um, several pages long. Like right now, I think it's in the 40s of, of pages long of exactly some of the things that we're looking for so yes like a and a car the specification for a car is less than two pages long thank you that's what and i need to essentially open to everybody yeah thank you appreciate that so we have a motion to receive and refer to council for approval anybody want to move that councillor yo and deputy mayor o'reilly any questions for todd on the report call the question all in favor that motion is passed. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. Thanks for sticking around. Okay. Uh, where are we? Memos. Uh, 8.1 is a memo from Councillor Yo regarding pool covers. Um, I'll just turn it over to Councillor Yo. Your memo, sir. Go ahead. Thank you for you, Mr. Mayor. It, um, basically, it's exactly what it says. Looking for a report back. Um, to, for staff report by the end of the second quarter regarding the use of protective covers on swimming pools as an option in lieu of fencing and gates. Um, if I get a seconder, I'll speak to it. So you'll move it. Second by Councillor Seymour Fagan. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, it's been brought up um, to my uh, to myself on several occasions, and um, and. And so I thought I'd bring it here and get a report back. And I know it's it's come before council previously, it's a few years back, but they've come a long way. 
They're very safe, but like a fence and a gate, they still need the human element, but they can only be open with the key. And when they are locked up and stuff, they're, they're weight bearing, you can, you can dance on them and they're, they're really good. Um, but like I say, they still have a human element, same as a gate being left open, these things have to be, be closed up by a human being. So, so I'd like to report back and um, because some people don't want a fence, they, they live out in the middle of the country, they don't want a fence. And um, they just want to put a hard cover on this thing and, um, and be just as safe as a fence, if not safer in some circumstances. So looking for that report. Sounds good. Councillor Seymour Fagan, do you want to speak to it? You seconded it? No, you're fine. Any questions, comments on the memo? Call the question then. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Uh, 8.2 is a memo regarding fishing over bridges and causeways. Councillor Yo, go ahead. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. This one, uh, I imagine, is going to get some uh, some flack and some backlash from all sorts of different people. But quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of the phone calls about garbage on the causeways and bridges from some of these fisher people who, quite honestly, are just pigs. Um, not all of them, and probably a minority of them are, are the, the culprits, but unless we do something, then, um, well, we got to do something, basically. So I'm looking for a report. I put in what I want to see in the report, but by all means, there's probably 50 other things that staff could put in there, and they're welcome to bring back the gamut of what we can do about it. And I uh, look for a seconder for this one as well, and look forward to a report back. So looking for options uh, seconded by Councillor Richardson. Um, go ahead, Councillor Yo. You spoke to it. I think you already have, but go ahead. Yeah, and like I say, just looking for options, to report back from staff, and uh, and hopefully maybe there's a simple solution. Maybe there's something easy we can put in for this year, um, because the last thing I want to see is banning fishing in a city that has, has over 250 lakes and rivers. But we have to do something to to one to to appease the, the taxpayer, two to appease Mother Nature, because a lot of the stuff's ending up in our in our waterways, and it's just not right and I'm not going to allow it to keep happening. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Richardson, you seconded it. Do you want to speak to it? I'm in full agreement. It was a, a year of some bad behavior, and I know most of us had heard stuff like this. So yeah, it's about listening to what we can do for our residents. And like you said, Mother Nature, and I support this. Okay, so get back some options, and we'll go from there. Um, any other questions, comments on the memo? Councillor, our Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, go ahead. You're muted, Pat. You're on mute, buddy. Oh, sorry. Uh, I support the motion. I just wondered if Councillor Yola thought anything around suggestion for enforcement. That's all. Whether it's major fines or who would enforce it. That's all. I think he's asked yeah, for. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Yola. Yeah, I kind of kind of spoke to it in there in a roundabout way, where um, one of the options could be uh, could be uh, enforcement and a fine fines or it could be uh, issuing licenses. So I'm looking for all all options coming back and even cleaning up every day, sending staff there every day. Let's, let's see what the, the ramification would be um, on our budget. And uh, nobody wants to see that, but, but we got to see it. So I'm looking for it all. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I'll call the question on the memo. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Uh, item 8.3 is a memo regarding the Mariposa Elementary School Zone Flashing Beacons by Councillor Vale. Go ahead, Councillor Vale. Thank you. Um, I think the memo is pretty self-explanatory. If I get a seconder, uh, I'll speak to it. Deputy Mayor O'Reilly will second. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. So basically the long and the short of it is, is uh, as we get closer to the Oakwood Fire Hall and the Little Britain Fire Hall, uh, merging together, um, we're going to have basically half of that volunteer contingent uh, driving, traveling from the Oakwood area to to get to the Little Britain Hall, which the main route is is the Eldon Road right past uh, the Mariposa Elementary School. Um, so the request is is that uh, for off school periods um, that we put the uh, flash and beacons that show when school is in session and that the lower speed is enforceable and when it's not in session. So if there's a fire call on a Friday night at eight o'clock, 
the speed would be 80 kilometers instead of the 40 kilometers through that through that uh, area. Thank you. Engineering, engineering is already priced out what the cost of doing that is. And um, the clerk's office has already looked at the, the actual bylaw for that school zone already says that it's enforceable uh, Monday to Friday from 7 till 5 p.m. It's just without the beacons, that's, nobody knows that. And, and there have been people pulled over uh, on Sunday, Sunday afternoons traveling through there. Thank you. Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, did you want to speak to it? You seconded it? No, you're good. Um, Okay, so the only question I have is the sixteen thousand dollars. I mean, did you talk to engineering of funding source? Is that something they're going to absorb in their budget? Is there any concerns there about how who's going to pay for it? My my understanding and engineering can cor correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Mike thought that they had room in their budget to deal with that. Okay. I guess my logical follow up. There's one, and my logical follow up, uh, director, is. If you've got, I know you have traffic signal components, a miscellaneous component in your budget, $45,000. I'm fine with utilizing that for it. I just, I just want to be assured that we're not pushing some other project that's already been approved by council and the capital plan is not getting done because you're sliding this one in instead. Or is this just sort of a fund that as things come up over the course of the year, we utilize it and, and this isn't going to push off any other projects is all I want to know. Yes, uh, for you, Mr. Mayor, uh, you're correct. If you look at page 31 of our approved capital budget under RD 2109, street lights and traffic signals, we carry 45,000 for miscellaneous. We have identified one project on the comments, the advanced green at McLaughlin Kent Street West, and uh, a catch-all, replacement and upgrades of various traffic signal components. So it would fall in that catch-all cate category. We're not pushing off any projects. Uh, this fund is specifically for things that come up either through council or through warrant, through petition, to fund uh, a small amount in any given, any given budget year. Uh, we will have to make an amendment to a bylaw, a minor amendment, uh, but I'm working with uh, our technical service department or our clerk to facilitate that for the next council meeting. Thank you. That's all I need to know. Any other questions from council? Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. Just a question through you to Director Rojas. Um, as far as schools signs, do we have a budget for them, like 60K signs? I know on Ward 6, we have two schools in Omimi, one in Downeyville, one in Dunsford, uh, parochial school on Heights Road, which was brought down to 60 kilometers. There's also two schools being constructed right now in the Mennonite community, uh, parochial schools right now. And would they be eligible for speed reduction signs in the future? For you, uh, Mr. Mayor, so we have a bylaw for school zones in particular. Uh, any development activity will go through the various site plan approval process. And as part of the site plan approval process, uh, all required signage, widenings, left turn lanes would be required. So it's captured there. Uh, for speed reduction, so for regulatory signs, a stop sign or a speed reduction, again, we do have a generic budget uh, because we know it comes up from time to time uh, to erect those signs on existing uh, roads. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I'll call the question then. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Okay, memo 8.4, memo regarding speed reduction on Pigeon Lake Road. Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, as, as, as it's uh, written here, just one little addition uh, under the second that, I'm um, not sure if everyone knows Purdue Road, but it's sort of like a giant semicircle. Um, when I say Purdue Road, I'd like to put down Purdue Road North, Purdue Road North entrance, because there's a south entrance and a north entrance, but I forgot to put in Purdue Road North. That's the only addition to that, if I could, please. So your motion that the memorandum regarding speed reduction Pigeon Lake Road from 1899 Pigeon Lake Road to Purdue Road North be received, that staff conduct a traffic study into the reduction of speed section 1899 Pigeon Lake Road to Purdue Road, Road North, staff report back by Q3 of this year and the recommendation go forward to council. 
Uh, moved by Council Ashmore, seconded by Councillor Yo. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ashmore, do you want to speak to it? I think you have, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Thank you very much. I'm good. Okay. Any further questions or comments uh, on the memo? Call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. And our last memo, uh, 8.5, is a memo regarding medical supply manufacturing. Council Ashmore, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's fairly self-explanatory there. Um, just asking for a report, that's all, just to have economic development staff look into it. That's all I'm asking for. I'm not saying any specific location, just throughout City Court of the Lakes, anywhere where they could find a suitable uh, location or present location. Well, I guess, I guess, well, let's get, see if somebody wants to second your memo and then we can have a discussion about it. Uh, uh, the memo is, I'll, I'll just read it. The memo from Council Ashmore regarding medical supply manufacturing be received. Economic development initiate the recruitment of medical supply manufacturers. That economic development work to attract companies to set up healthcare manufacturing facilities in available existing buildings currently vacant. And that this recommendation uh, go forward to council. So moved by Councillor Ashmore. Uh, anybody want a second? Anybody want a second? The memo? Third call, Councillor Yo will second the memo. Okay. Councillor Ashmore, did you want to speak to it or? Yeah, like I, I really don't think I really need to, to write this memo, but I'm surprised I'm. Uh, you know, there's a bit of hesitancy here. I think uh, this is a, a given thing here. I mean, I've, it's not just medical supplies. I mean, we're looking at different, ever since I came on board here a couple of years ago, I've talked to several companies, um, Princess Auto, Amazon, Mahindra, SpaceX, Canadian Shield, uh, Viking Aerospace, trying to get them to set up locations here, try and try and produce jobs. That's why, that's why I was elected. One of my things is try and get some more jobs here for our for our people, and uh, I don't see anything wrong in this. If I and, and economic development and going out here's here's the telephone. It's one of the world's greatest inventions. All we have to do is make phone calls. That's all I'm asking for. We don't need any much more expense than that. That's all I'm asking for economic development to sort of step it up a bit, make some phone calls, inquiries about. Uh, companies that can come here and set up production and create jobs. And because we've got zero development charges up to 27,000 square feet, 2,500 square meters, I think it's a great idea. I'd appreciate your support. Yeah, and, and, and I get it. And, and I know, Councillor Richardson, you have a couple of questions, but I guess my hesitancy is just that you're, you're zoning it in specifically on medical supply manufacturers, and you're not saying come back with ideas you're actually saying initiate the recruitment work to attract companies i guess you're you're giving the impression that they're not which i think they are um you know and when you say that you're trying to attract jobs here i think we're all on board with that counselor so you know i know when you when you did the letter you know you there was some good press out of this uh that you know it, it's a great idea we need manufacturing jobs we're all working toward that and council made some pretty aggressive moves to waive development charges to attract it and, and economic development is using that as a tool to, to try to get it. I think my hesitancy is that you're, you know, you're specifying it in on just medical supply manufacturers when it, it could be a little bit more broad. It could be just come back with a plan on what you're doing and how you can, I'm, that, that's all I'm struggling with. But uh, we'll see what else. Councillor Richardson, go ahead. Thank you and through you and I'm in full agreement with Councillor Ashmore that yes we do need manufacturing and we do need jobs. I think where I initially struggled with this is when you brought the correspondence to Council and you know you're focusing on the whole medical supply manufacturing angle. I feel like we're chasing smoke. Any of these factories that could be retrofitted have been retrofitted. Any companies that have been startup companies have already met that demand. So our supply and demand has caught up and I'm watching documentaries on that, reading the news and this is what I'm hearing out there. When, I'm, when I look at this, I'm thinking, well, maybe we can get an update from economic development about you know, where we are and where we're going because we just approved that rural economic development program application back in January. 
We heard today through um, a presentation, the GIS, how much information that's going to bring to our economic development office. I'm just thinking at this time, um, you know, we, we're, we're in, a, in a market right now where we, we know where our strengths are. We know our partners that we have locally now. What are our workforce challenges and what can we do to help our existing businesses? So I'm just, you know, at this time, I'm just feeling like maybe we can segue this and ask for maybe an update through economic development before we make a, a decision on this particular direction. And that's just my personal opinion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vale and then Yo. Thanks, and, and I totally agree with um, Councillor Richardson and just one step further than that. I, th I think we're already uh, doing what Councillor Ashmore is looking for, right? Um, Council gave direction to economic development um, to look at a, a business attraction uh, strategy or, or plan, right? Which, which my understanding in conversations with economic development uh, that they've not only uh, looked at that and and started down that road. Uh, they've submitted for funding to implement just that. And my understanding is is that report is supposed to be coming back in May, which will deal with an entire business attraction uh, campaign uh, along with the strategy. Thank you, Councillor Yo. Go ahead. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. I'm glad I seconded this for uh, conversation and uh, because there's been some good conversation. And Ron, it, um, it's, it's the right idea. It, um, I struggle with the wording as well, and I wasn't going to second it, but, um, but I thought I should to get the conversation going, and, and it's good. Um, I'm not going to support the motion as it's written. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support... The, um, economic development doing what they're doing now and waiting for that report coming back and uh, and and go from there because uh, we've, we've, we've done a lot so let's let's stay focused let's stay together on this and uh, get some good things out of it down the road um, down the, the very near road thank you thank you Councillor Seymour Fagan go ahead Yes, thank you through you. Um, yeah, so I just uh, want to agree with Tracy, uh, Councillor Richardson and Councillor Vale. Uh, economic development has been working towards this for, for years. And with the economic development task force with the pandemic, that is one of the priorities. So they are coming forward with something and they have been working with businesses. It's not like they're sitting back doing nothing. They're a very, very pro proactive group. So yeah, um, I, you know I understand what you're what you're trying to get at, Councillor Ashmore, but they're already doing this. Thank you, Deputy Mayor O'Reilly. Go ahead. I'll I'll just be brief. I think the the ideal time is to wait for this report coming back. I think we're all interested in economic development when we're councillors for the whole city. So I think that you know just recently. Uh, on Councillor Yo's ward, uh, they tore down the old uh, schoolhouse up there, and uh, I sent three prospective people there to look at the lot to either build a townhouse or a retirement home or something along those lines. Uh, people have asked me for, for, for small projects, but uh, anyway, so I think we're all working in the same theme, and uh, I look forward to seeing the report come back in May. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Councillor Ashmore, do you want to sum up? Okay, well, I, I sort of know where this is going to go, but uh, I, I feel that, you know, we really need to be more aggressive in, in attracting employers. Like I, you know, I've reached out to these companies, Amazon, Mahindra, Princess Auto, Viking Aerospace, and I don't know why they can't follow up with these companies. I mean, these are great companies, SpaceX, they want to build satellite receivers um, and they're looking for locations and we should be you know, at least contacting them and, and getting in touch with them. So I'll just leave it. I know where it's going to go here. It's not going to pass, unfortunately, but I, you know, I respect everybody's opinion, but I, I think we need to, I really don't think we, we should wait another six months for a report. I think economic development should be, you know, getting on the phone and ringing up these places and seeing if they express some interest in coming here. We've got lots to offer here. And I, 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 I'm proud of this location of the city, Fourth Lakes. I, I, I'm not going to wait, you know, like, I don't think we should wait. 
I think now's the, the opportune time to attract economic development. Uh, I know we're doing that through the various through our various uh, economic through our economic development and the task force, the economic development recovery task force, which is great. But I think we we just need to be more aggressive about it. So I'll leave it at that then. Thank you. I'll call the question on the memo as printed. Uh, all in favor? Uh, motion fails. Can I just get a motion to receive the memo, uh, please, just to, to finish it off because it's on the agenda? Count Deputy Mayor O'Reilly, seconded by Councillor Yo. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. And that's all we have. And just a motion to adjourn, please. And thank you for your patience today. Councillor Yo, seconded by Councillor Elmsley. All in favor? That motion is passed, and just uh, thank you. Have a good evening, and a reminder that our next meeting is February 16th at 1 o'clock, and the intentions, if nothing changes, is to have it in council chambers if you choose to come in. You can still zoom in if you're not comfortable, but that is the intention. We will keep you posted. Have a good evening.